Ну, качай. Okay, we're going to get started. If you can silence your cell phones, or you could turn them off and get a little break, social media break. If you have them on, we want you to tweet about what you're hearing. We're going to get started. I want to start of this, everyone. I am Carlos Manchaca, chair of New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. And today, the Committee on Immigration will be hearing a package of legislation drafted in response to the federal administration's new rule regarding inadmissibility on public charge grounds. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of what this means for everyday New Yorkers, I want to thank the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and Commissioner, specifically Commissioner Mustafi, for their collective leadership on this issue. Your willingness to work with the Council and ever-present availability has strengthened the legislative package significantly uh, and is a testament to how much we can accomplish when we coordinate our efforts. Together, we are stronger. And I am so pleased that when threats come to our city, we waste no time uniting to defend our neighbors. Some version of a public charge rule has been in the news for more than 18 months. At council, at the city council, we have been taking this extremely serious. The threat of an expanded public charge rule is serious. Analyzing the leaked drafts and official proposed rule when they were made public holding a public hearing in November 2018 on the potential impact such a rule would have on New Yorkers is grave, and submitting a strongly worded public comment opposing the rule. Our partners held a briefing on public charge for city council members and their district staff, and I held a series of town halls in all five boroughs to address community concerns about the proposed rule. Through these efforts, we were able to educate New Yorkers about the proposed rule and encourage comments in the Federal Register, along with Moya. And comments to that federal government uh, was required by law to consider and respond to before determining the, val the validity of a proposed change. And yet, despite the 200 plus thousand public comments, the vast majority of which were against any change of this rule, on August 12th, 2019, the federal administration released a final version of the public charge rule titled, Inadmissibility on the Public Charge Grounds. The new rule expands the definition of public charge and public benefits, thereby altering, altering the standard used by the Department of Homeland Security to determine if an individual is likely to become a public charge at any time in the future. As of now, the rule will go into effect on October 15, 2019. A public charge, as defined by this new rule, is an individual who is or is likely to become dependent on public benefits. A public charge determination occurs when an individual is either applying for a visa to enter the U.S., extending an ex existing visa, or applying for legal permanent residence, a green card for the first time. And I want to be clear here that public charge did and will not apply to U.S. citizens, to current green card holders, to asylees, to refugees, to U and T visa holders, special immigrant youth, applicants under the Violence Against Women Act, or Afghans and Iraqis on special immigrant visas. It is such a complex and confusing rule. It is extremely important that you seek legal counsel to determine if it affects you or your family before making any decisions about public benefits. 
If you or someone you know has any questions about whether the rule applies to them, please seek out expert legal advice immediately. The council, the mayor's office, and our community partners are committed to ensuring that no New Yorker feels pressured to disenroll from critical benefits without first speaking with a trusted lawyer. You can call the New, American hot, New Americans hotline at 1-800-566-7636 or Action NYC at one 800 354 0365 right now to speak to someone about public charge and I urge you to call. Clearly this rule is designed to ensure that as many individuals as possible disenroll from life-saving and family sustaining government benefits. As council members of the city of New York it is our responsibility to protect the rights and welfare of all our residents and our city is home to 3.2 million immigrants making up nearly 37% of the city's population. Immigrants also comprise nearly half the city's workforce and own approximately 42% of the city's businesses. Ours is a beautiful, diverse, and resilient city. That is precisely because of our immigrant families, neighbors, and friends. This is the envy of the world. And that is why I'm pleased to announce that we are hearing a package of four bills and one resolution regarding public charge today. This legislative package strengthens a social services network that has become a national model for how to care for and empower everyone. Our responsibility as elected officials and members of the city council is to do everything that we can to protect people who live and work in New York City. These bills and resolutions uh, exercise that duty. The pre-considered intro uh, sponsored by myself would, uh, let me get the numbers actually. That's right, because they're pre-considered. The pre-considered intro, sponsored by myself, would require the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to conduct training on the provisions included in the new public charge rule to employees in the Department of Social Services, Human Resources Administration, the Department of Homeless Services, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and the New York City Housing Authority. This bill would take effect immediately after it became law and deemed repealed two years after it became law. Preconsidered intro uh, sponsored by Councilmember Moya would require the Department of Social Services to distribute information by mail, telephone, or email regarding all city-funded emergency food programs. The next pre-considered intro sponsored by Councilmember Rivera would require the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to create written and electronic materials on the public charge rule, and the Department of Education would be required to distribute these materials to every student in every DOE school. The next pre-considered intro, sponsored by Councilmember Cabrera, would require the Department of Social Services and the Human Resources Administration to designate a unit with a dedicated phone number and staff to assist individuals who have evaluated their case with the legal service provider and have elected to modify their benefits. The next pre-considered reso, sponsored by Councilmember Levin, calls on the U.S. Congress to take legislative action to stop the enactment of the new rule entitled inadmissibility on public charge grounds. We are joined today by Council Members Chin, Jonai, Rivera, Moya, and Miller. I want to thank them for being here today. Uh, and before I turn it over to the bill sponsors to say a few words, I want to thank my staff for all their work on this hearing on public charge uh, and everything that has been done up to this point, which has been a lot. My Chief of Staff, Lorena Lucero, Communications Director, Tony Chirito, and the, uh, the committee staff, Committee Council Harbani Auja, Committee Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, and Finance Unit Head Krillian Francisco. Uh, we're gonna hear from uh, Councilmember Moya, member of the Immigration Committee, and then Councilmember Rivera on their statements. Councilmember Moya. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, for uh, all your hard work and uh, the opportunity to uh, say a few words uh, on such an important issue. Uh, as I've always said, I will never begrudge someone who comes here in search of the American dream uh, and works through blood, sweat, and tears to make that a reality. Um, as a son of immigrants, 
Uh, I know this all too well, but uh, this is exactly what this Trump administration uh, is doing uh, to the immigrants that are here uh, in this country now. Uh, their wealth for the public charge will deter immigrants from getting the help that they need. This bill will ensure that those who disenroll from SNAP or whose SNAP benefits are set to lapse will be given information on emergency feeding programs. Uh, and it is incumbent upon us as elected officials to take care of uh, our constituents regardless of their national origin or their economic status. Uh, and I just want to take this opportunity again to thank uh, the chairman, the speaker, uh, and all my colleagues uh, in helping to support uh, this much needed bill. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much, Chairman Chaka and all of my colleagues. And thank you for holding this hearing today on what is a very important package of legislation. The public charge rule proposed by the federal administration is an attempt to generate fear chaos and confusion in the immigrant community. It is deliberately designed to threaten essential programs that countless immigrant families depend on for their health, housing, nutrition, and more. For many, this rule will force them to choose between their families, well-being, and a potential threat to their immigrant status. And it's our responsibility as a council to do what we can to support immigrants who call New York home and who will suffer under the proposed rule. That is why I'm proud to introduce a bill as part of this package requiring the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to create written and electronic materials on the federal regulations relating to admissibility on public charge grounds. The Department of Education will distribute these materials both physically and electronically to every student and every school within its jurisdiction and additionally ensure that these materials are available in a central and accessible office in every school for both parents and students. These materials would also include crucial information on federal regulations as well as instructions on how to access immigration legal services to address any issues related to regula regulatory charges, changes. There's a lot of noise right now surrounding this rule. It is important that families know precisely whether or not they are affected. It will not be easy for immigrant parents to navigate the web of information on these matters while also ensuring stability at home. So providing these materials to their children may be the best way to cut through misinformation and get these details to those who need it most. I am proud to stand with the legislative body that has demonstrated care for every person in our city and I hope my colleagues will join me in continuing to ensure every person, regardless of their immigration status, knows that New York City government is standing with them every day. Thank you. Thank you to the bill sponsors and we're gonna call the administration up for our first panel. Uh, Commissioner Bita Mustofi. We have Administrator Grace Bonilla from HRA, and then Chris Keeley, New York City Health and Hospitals, if you please come on up. And as you get settled in, I just want to reiterate the confidence that I have in this administration uh, in partnership with our work and the advocates that you will hear from later. I spent some time this summer uh, after the shootings in El Paso and with my family. And I know, Commissioner, you were there uh, this last uh, year. And coming back to New York City made me just appreciate the work that we do and the amount of work that we've done so far to prepare. And our message today is one of, of confidence and calm to our New Yorkers who have an incredible team working together to figure this out and to ensure that we have the best, uh, the best strategy moving forward. And it's not a new strategy, it's a strategy that's been there, we're just gonna add to it. And so I just wanna say thank you before you start for the work that you and your team does. We're gonna swear you in. Okay. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you to Chair Menchaca and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Vita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and I'm joined today by HRA Administrator Grace Bonilla, as well as staff from other agencies, including Chris Keeley from Health and Hospitals. Just a few weeks ago, the Trump administration published a regulation that is meant to change when certain immigrants are considered a public charge for immigration purposes. 
The rule makes it harder for those immigrants to receive a green card or certain visas. This rule, which discriminates against people with disabilities, seniors, and people of color in the name of self-sufficiency, was fundamentally flawed from its, in its conception. The city knows firsthand that immigrants make our community stronger and that supporting immigrants in accessing the services they need to produce long -term can produce long-term benefits. The Trump administration's view of self-sufficiency, on the other hand, is based on falsehoods and biased thinking and runs counter to the reality of how immigrants contribute to our country. Given this reality, it is impossible to see this rule as anything other than an attack on, Amer on the American ideal. The vision of Lady Liberty, also known as the mother of exiles, welcoming your tired, your poor, your, and your huddled masses for generations. I'm particularly concerned with the widespread fear and confusion that this rule has incited, even in those who are not affected by it at all. At the outset, I want to emphasize that this rule has not yet gone into effect. It will not be retroactively applied. It does not affect all immigration applications, and it does not affect all immigrants. For that reason, it is extremely important for immigrants to get information and help before unnecessarily withdrawing from or forgoing benefits. As a city, we've been preparing for this rule since the beginning of the Trump administration, as the council member noted. Our preparation has led to sustained advocacy and public education on this issue. The city submitted two comments on the proposed rule, including one in conjunction with cities across the nation who share our point of view. We've repeatedly engaged stakeholders, including elected officials, with information about the rule and its impact. For almost a year, we've prepared our Action NYC hotline for an influx of calls about the rule by adding staff to provide immediate consultations on the phone to help individuals understand whether the rule applies to them and by working with partners to create capacity for referrals for urgent legal consultations. And we've developed detailed fact sheets and conducted research on messaging. This testimony will provide a very brief overview of the rule, highlighting the city's response and Moya's role in that response, and address the bills at issue today. As I stated, changes to the public charge rule have not gone into effect. The final rule was published on August 14th, and it will, is scheduled to become effective on October 15th, unless courts say otherwise. The public charge rule applies only to a narrow subset of immigrants. Those applying for a green card, changing or extending certain visas, and applying for admission under the immigration laws would be affected by the final rule. But many, if not most, non-citizens in New York City will not be subject to the public charge test or will be able to seek a waiver. This includes refugees and asylees, certified victims of human trafficking or U or T visa recipients, VAWA self-petitioners, special immigrant juveniles, those with temporary protected statuses, and more. In addition, there is no public charge test when green card holders apply for citizenship. Turning now to the final rule itself, the term public charge is used in immigration law to deny admission or green card to someone based on their likelihood to depend on the government for support in the future. For the past two decades, this rule has been limited in scope because studies showed that an overbroad, vague rule could have devastating public health and nutrition consequences. Despite this longstanding policy, and frankly, responsible policy, the final rule changes the definition of public charge and creates a new overbroad test that will disproportionately harm immigrants of color, immigrants with disabilities, and immigrants with limited resources when they seek to, to change their status. This will primarily affect family-based immigration. The final rule changes how closely the federal government scrutinizes factors such as an individual's age, education, employment history, income, assets, health conditions, among other factors, when determining whether an immigrant is likely to become a public charge in the future. Even if the individual has never used benefits in the past, it also increases the number of programs that will be considered when evaluating whether someone is a public charge. In addition to cash assistance, the government will consider use of Medicaid, SNAP, public housing, and Section 8 housing assistance. For Medicaid, there are some notable exceptions, including for pregnant women, children, emergencies, and more. 
To re-emphasize, benefits use is just one factor in addition to the others I just mentioned in an overall test of who is likely to become a public charge. We've argued against this rule since it was first proposed because it will needlessly harm the health, safety, and economic security of our city. While the rule itself only affects a small subset of all non-citizens, we know that it will create fear and confusion in the immigration, immigrant population generally. Our preliminary analysis shows that hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers could be affected by chilling effects alone. We've already heard concerning anecdotes of immigrants withdrawing from important benefits due to fear and misunderstanding about the rule and its impact. For example, even before the final rule was published, the Department of Health saw that anxiety and confusion was causing some clients to withdraw from or refuse to enroll in Medicaid and CHIP. DOHMH staff have reported that clients sought to disenroll or declined to enroll in Medicaid or CHIP because of public charge. In addition to foregoing health insurance, staff reported that some of their clients have declined services, while others have shown reluctance to engage with them or use services, even though these services are not covered by the final rule. In order to help address the fear, DOHMH's Bureau of Primary Care Access and Planning provided training to its frontline staff for public-facing programs, explaining the public charge rule and providing guidance for staff to address client inquiries and concerns. DOHMH is also planning another round of briefing to frontline staff at various divisions and bureaus now that the final rule has been published. In addition, since rumors of the public charge rule began circulating in 2017, there's been a marked drop in non-citizen SNAP cases. Administrator Bonilla will testify more about this chilling effect and the steps the HRA has taken to address it. Turning now to the city's response to the rule, we are fighting this rule with every tool at our disposal, including litigation. We've partnered with the New York State Attorney General's Office in a legal challenge to this final rule. One important tool to counter the effects of the, this rule is legal services. The city is committed to assisting all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, in getting the information and legal assistance that they need to make the best decisions for themselves and their families as to their usage of public benefits. To re-emphasize, it is crucial that New Yorkers who are concerned about whether the public charge rule will affect them get trustworthy and competent legal help before taking any action related to public benefits. As I said, the new regulation is not yet in effect, and if and when it does come into effect, only certain immigrant New Yorkers will be impacted in their immigration applications. Over the last several months, we've worked closely with legal service provider, community, and other partners to ensure the availability of legal assistance around the rule. The Action NYC hotline, funded by the City of New York and operated by our partner Catholic Charities, can provide immigrants with information about the rule and, where needed, connect callers to legal help and appointments. We are also working with partners at the Legal Aid Society, supported by the Robin Hood Foundation and the New York Legal Assistance Group, to coordinate requests for assistance and to address urgent needs. In a few days, on September 9th and 10th, we will be holding a two-day phone bank with partners at Catholic Charities, Univision, El Diario, the Office for New Americans, the Legal Aid Society, the New York Immigration Coalition, Hispanic Federation, and NILAG, where New Yorkers may call in to speak with an immigration legal expert who can answer questions about public charge. We will also be holding a Facebook Live panel with legal experts on September 12th. We have worked to make sure that all immigration legal service providers, including those from smaller organizations, have access to the most up-to-date analysis about the public charge regulation. Working with experts at CLINIC, the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, we've disseminated training materials to our Action NYC providers and are also working on a New York City-specific webinar for immigration legal service providers that will also be made available to members of the private bar, or private attorneys representing immigrants. The city's leaders have continued to share information and resources with immigrant New Yorkers during the rulemaking process. The mayor, our Cities for Action Coalition, and our partners at DSS, H&H, &H, and others have publicly condemned the public charge final rule and shared information about how to connect with legal services. Our outreach staff and teams on the ground are conducting numerous field engagements as well. 
Senior administration staff have also spoken at houses of worship and in communities to share information about the final rule. When news about the rule broke, we shared information digitally to, to our many partners. On August 13th, we re first received news that the final rule would be published. We sent an update to over 9,000 people and partners, including our community partners, our partners within uh, the council and other elected officials, and our agency partners. We then held briefings to answer follow-up questions, and additionally, we created a, and shared a social media toolkit so that different agencies could share relevant and easy to understand information about the public charge rule with their networks. On August 25th, we hosted a day of action to address immigrant New Yorkers' concerns about the new public charge rule. Moya staff, partners, and volunteers handed out thousands of informational flyers at over a dozen grocery stores across the five boroughs to empower our residents to make the best decisions for themselves and their families and not to needlessly forego public benefits to which they are entitled. We've also engaged with the press. We've participated in press conferences with our partners at the New York Immigration Coalition and the Asian American Federation and coordinated media appearances with local media outlets, including WNYC, 1010 Winds, Pix11, Univision, and New York One. Moya, in partnership with city agencies, is also involved in planning for mitigation of the harms of the final rule if it were to ever go into effect. Specifically, we're in discussions with various partners about how to ensure that New Yorkers will still be able to get the help that they need, even if the rule prevents them from accessing certain public benefits or creates fear and concern. The city is committed to serving everyone, regardless of status, and eligibility of city services and benefits have not changed. As just one example, all patients are welcome at New York City Health and Hospitals, regardless of status or ability to pay. Through H&H &H and NYC Care, we're ensuring that even those without insurance have access to affordable health care they need. Similarly, the city is in close conversation with those community-based organizations who provide emergency assistance to those in crises. My colleagues at DSS, for example, have been engaged with emergency food assistance providers to ensure that we understand the current need and can keep abreast of any concerning trends. We will continue to monitor the impact of public charge and are prepared to support our communities as needed. Moving now to the pre-considered bills, we are very grateful that we've been able to work closely with the council on public charge and so many other attacks on our immigrant communities. We look forward to continuing to work with you as we contend with the fear and confusion already created in the communities that we, sh we both serve. I want to say at the outset that our goal as a city has always been to address the fear and misinformation circulating about public charge. One of the most devastating aspects of this rule is how much it has harmed people who are not even named or subjected to it. Our overriding goal is to ensure that we as a city are not feeding the false narratives of the Trump administration and the way that it wants immigrants to buy into it. We want our communities to access the services that they need and be empowered to make the right decisions for themselves and their families. We certainly support the intent of the bills to ensure that New Yorkers are armed with the information and the resources that they need in this difficult time. And as noted above, we're working closely with our partners at DSS, DHS, HPD, NYCHA, and others to ensure that relevant staff understand the scope of the rule and how it will affect the populations that they serve. In addition, we've engaged those partners on how they should and can refer people to immigration legal support. Relatedly, we're developing information to be shared with DOE in multiple languages in order to inform parents and families about the public charge final rule and how to seek legal assistance to understand the, how the rule may or may not affect them. As we found in our survey on public charge, the most effective messaging we can share at this time is how people can seek legal advice. Moya has also been working since the proposed rule was published to ensure that our hotline would be able to address, as I noted, any influx or change in calls. This includes adding our staff to provide crucial and immediate screening for callers. We also partnered, with, as I said, with the Legal Aid Society and the New York Legal Assistance Group, in addition to our primary Action NYC partner, Catholic Charities, to ensure our availability of urgent legal consultations for those who need it. Action NYC is really the best referral to make for people unsure of how the rule may affect them or may not. We look forward to working with the council with, 
on these bills to ensure that we're providing links to invaluable information on public charge and its effects without stoking the misinformation circulating in our communities. We understand that this rule is complicated and frightening. Many of our immigrant families are concerned about how this final rule will affect them. And I want to end today's testimony by reiterating that the rule is not yet in effect. It does not apply to all immigrants, nor does it apply to all immigrant applications. It doesn't apply to those seeking citizenship. Many categories are exempted. I urge all who have questions and concerns to please get legal advice. You can call 311 or call 1-800-3540-365 and say public charge to be connected with free and safe legal guidance to make an informed and empowered decision for you or your loved ones. The Trump administration's idea of who deserves to be here is based on a racist vision of a white and rich America a vision that is out of touch with American principles and with the reality of how the contributions of immigrants to this country improve the lives of all of us. We will do everything in our power to making sure that idea does not become a reality. And again, I want to thank the chair for your commitment and your vision in working alongside us and the communities that we both serve to ensure that we're doing as effective uh, efficient and timely a job as we can and thank all the members of the committee. Really, I think the council has been tremendous in uh, members themselves even individually owning how critical this is, submitting comments that speak to personal family experiences and community experiences. And I think this is really emblematic of how much something like this touches on the lives of so many people and so much of what we're fighting for here in our city. So thank you so much for allowing me to testify, and I'm going to turn it to my colleague. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chalk and members of the Immigration Committee for giving us the opportunity to testify today. My name is Grace Bonilla, and I'm the Administrator of the New York City Human Resources Administration. I want to thank Commissioner Mustofi and the partnership we have with Moya to ensure immigrant New Yorkers are getting up-to-date and accurate information concerning public charge. Since the leak of the public charge rule, we have been working to ensure that all New Yorkers in need have access to our agency's benefits and services. And it is important for me, as the administrator of the nation's largest social services agency, particularly given the current punitive executive policy climate in Washington, D.C., to unequivocally restate our commitment to addressing the social and economic barriers that all New Yorkers face. Each year, HRA addresses the needs of more than three million low-income New Yorkers, including immigrants. To provide context for this hearing, I would like to briefly touch on the services HRA provides both independently and in partnership with sister agencies to improve the lives of immigrant New Yorkers. My written testimony includes details of the Department of Social Services Office for Advocacy and Outreach, which includes the Office of Refugee and Immigrant Affairs, as well as full detail concerning HRA's legal services programs through the Office of Civil Justice, including the extraordinary investment in legal services to fund anti-eviction legal services and anti-harassment and tenant protection. Let me take a moment to talk about the few, a few of OCJ's programs that serve immigrant New Yorkers. The Immigrant Opportunity Initiative, IOI, is a network of uh, nonprofit legal providers and community-based organizations who, con who conduct outreach in immigrant communities across the city and provide legal assistance to low-income immigrant New Yorkers in matters ranging from citizenship and lawful permanent residency application to more complex immigrant matters, including asylum application and removal defense work. Action NYC is operated jointly by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, HRA, and City University of New York, and implemented in collaboration with over 20 community-based organizations and legal services providers across the five boroughs. Additional programs include community service block grant programs, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, and the Immigrant Child Advocate Relief Effort. I Care Unaccompanied Minor and Family Initiative. More details about these programs as well as IDNYC and New York Citizenship can be found in my written testimony as well as HRA's website. I thank my colleagues for providing a succinct, my colleague Commissioner Mustafi for providing a succinct and final uh, of the final rule 
and current state of affairs on this issue and want to reiterate some very important points from Commissioner Mustafi's testimony. First of all, it's important that all New Yorkers understand that pro the eligibility for our benefits has not changed. This rule is not retroactive. This rule is currently not in effect. The rule itself affects a subset of immigrant New Yorkers seeking to adjust their status. This rule is intended to sow fear among our immigrant communities. If you're concerned that your receipt of benefits might affect your immigrant status, please seek legal assistance through Action NYC's hotline. If you or your family are in need of assistance, we are here to serve you. The new rule expands the list of public benefits considered under public charge. Under the final rule, the determination of whether an individual is likely to become a public charge would also require a more stringent totality of the circumstances test, even for those immigrants who have not used or are covered benefit. This may change how closely the federal government scrutinizes factors such as individuals' age, education, employment history, income, assets, and health conditions, among other factors, when determine, determining whether an immigrant is likely to become a public charge. Because of this, we are urging any New Yorker who has questions about how the final rule might affect them to seek legal assistance. HRA and DHS frontline staff have been made aware of the rule through official communications from Commissioner Banks, and training has been conducted to ensure staff refers clients to the information, inform, informative flyer created by our coll colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, which provides information on how to contact Action NYC. The flyer is being made available at all HRA and DHS client-facing locations. All staff have been told to refer any client with questions about the impact of the receipt of benefits to Action NYC. Through these referrals to Action NYC, clients can speak with trained professionals and ask questions about how access, accessing public benefits may or may not impact their immigration status. There continues to be information on our internal website about legal service referrals for immigrants so that the entirety of our staff may easily access the information and make appropriate referrals to those free and anonymous legal resources. Lastly, Access HRA continues to provide information on immigration legal services for anyone who has questions, which will reach those New Yorkers who are conducting business with us online and not coming into our, our centers or seeking information about applying for benefits for the first time. As of June 2019, SNAP has helped 1.5 million New Yorkers, or nearly 20% of the city's population, but f putting food on the table and feeding, uh, feeding their families. This includes approximately 200,000 eligible non-citizens. To understand the impact of the federal government proposed rule, HRA conducted an analysis of SNAP enrollment earlier this year. The analysis looked at our year-to-year -year change between eligible U.S. citizens and non-citizens. In the last two years, since news of the me and media outlets first began reporting of potential changes to the public charge rule, non-citizens who are eligible for lawfully receiving SNAP benefits have either, uh, have either chosen not to continue with the program at a higher rate than U.S. citizens. This is particularly concerning as each of these New Yorkers are lawfully receiving SNAP benefits. We look forward to working with the sponsors of the two bills that impact HRA. We stand in a position of great responsibility to provide real-time factual information about what public charge is and what it is not, as well as who it will impact. HRA supports providing all clients with information about the assistance available to them. This legislation would, would require DSS to share a notice by mail or email by the about the availability of emergency food programs to all SNAP recipients who choose to disenroll on or after June 1st, 2016, to those currently receiving SNAP and, and, and when they recertify. We welcome the uh, proposal from the council, but we want to make it clear that this information would be provided to all SNAP recipients, irrespective of public charge. And to prevent any targeting of any client, the receipt of such information is not being provided because a recipient is impacted by public charge. This approach will enable us to reach a broader group of clients and protect those who may, be, who may believe that they are impacted by public charge. Again, we remind all New Yorkers who have questions about public charge to consult with an accredited trusted legal provider to discuss their individual circumstances. 
We support the intent of the bills and would like to continue to work with the council to ensure that its implementation will not contribute to the chilling effect we have seen. On Council Member Cabretta's pre uh, pre-considered bill as stated, we are working to ensure that our staff and clients have timely factual information about public charge. We look forward to working with the council to achieve that end, including the use of Action NYC, one hotline for concerned individuals to obtain accurate information and to limit confusion. All this said, our doors are open and we encourage any and all New Yorkers in need to come to seek help. There has been no change in our long-standing policy that permits any family or individual to apply for assistance, and there has been no change in current law regarding what benefits immigrants are eligible to receive. We will continue doing what we do best, which is provide critical services to everyone who is eligible. Since the release of the proposed rule, we have been partnering with our colleague agencies, advocates, and stakeholders to better understand how the recent federal actions are playing out in the community. We will continue working with our partners to keep our ears to the ground and to provide accurate, useful information to New Yorkers on this topic. While the final rule has not gone into effect, this policy direction will harm New Yorkers, not only those who may be directly impacted by the rule, but also through the chilling effect among those to whom the rule does not apply, but who change their behavior in favor of adverse, in fear of adverse immigration consequences. New York City is a proud city of immigrants, and we will do everything we can to prevent the Trump administration's proposed harmful actions on public charge from going into effect. We are committed to ensuring all New Yorkers, including immigrants, have access to the services they need. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before the council today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, both of you, for uh, a, a robust testimony, set of testimony. And I know uh, Mr. Keeley is, is, is also here to ask, answer any questions. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna ask council members uh, of the bills to hold their statements uh, because we have a lot of questions that we wanna get through. And I hope there's no time limits on your side, um, but we wanna get through as many questions as we can. So I'm gonna start with a few questions where I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna hand it over for a few minutes to the authors of the bills to ask questions about their bills. And then we'll move forward. Thank you. Uh, so, Commissioner, has there been a documented increase in the number of calls to Action NYC related to public charge since the final rule published in, 20, uh, in August of 2019? Sure, so we're currently working with our, um, our partners at Catholic Charities who operate our, Catholic, our uh, Action NYC hotline to monitor um, our call, call volume. We have seen an in increase in calls um, generally, as we did last fall um, when the proposal was first issued. We saw a spike in the fall. We did. Uh, in November, we kind of heard that. And then you're saying that we're going to learn more from the partners soon about any spike. Yeah. We, as I said, we've seen an increase in calls oh, we generally. Have. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the goals in the upcoming uh phone bank is to kind of more broadly share the word. As we saw last time, we saw a huge increase on the day of the phone bank. Um, and then that uh, resulted in increased awareness and a kind of continued increase in the number of calls. So Action NYC is going to be very important here in the strategy, correct? Yes. So we want to get a lot of understanding about Action yep. NYC. So how many languages can the Action NYC hotline support? Um, the hotline can support over 150, up to 200, I believe, languages through, um, we have certainly uh, individuals who speak multiple languages answering calls, but can provide interpretation services in up to 200 languages. What proportion of callers are contacting Action NYC in a language other than English, and what are those languages? I don't have the breakdown for you today. Um, I can say, generally speaking, a large proportion um, call uh, caller. A large proportion of our callers speak Spanish um, and also English, and a smaller number, though some, speak different languages. How long, on average, do callers who speak languages other than English have to wait to speak to someone with their language capability? Um, I don't, again, I don't have the breakdown on the languages, but we can get back to you on that specifically. Um, we have not, 
it has not been reported to us that people have to wait for long periods to speak to somebody, um, nor has it been reported since we've operated the hotline that there's been challenges in accessing an interpreter for specific languages. So I don't know of any, usually know if there's an issue. <laughs> right. I don't right. know of there being an issue. Well, and I guess what we're trying to get to is, is, is there data that, yeah. can, that can get pulled? And what we're asking for is not just the breakdown of languages, but the time in which it takes for someone sure. to call uh, and get someone. Sure. And you'll have you have that data. It's it's out there. We definitely have the the number of languages. We record that. Um, but not and, the time. And we can indicate um, based on conversations with our providers if time has been an issue in terms of needing to wait for the service. Okay, we'll follow up on that. Sure. What is the protocol when there are no staff able to provide interpretation on the language spoken by the caller? Um, as I said, that is not something that has arisen. It is not a challenge that we. Which seen. is different from protocol. So I'm looking for sure. protocol. What is what happens? What 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 internally has to happen? Any issue that arises, be it that or another one. What we have regular reporting and communication with our uh, provider with Catholic Charities, and they let us know if they have a challenge in any issue, and then we work with them to resolve it. That might mean identifying additional interpretation or translation services. It might be something totally different. But the protocol in general is, if any issue arises that could include. Uh, we were unable to access interpretation in this language, that gets elevated to our project manager who works closely with the hotline so that we can resolve it. Okay. And we have a number of ways of resolving things like that, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's Part what we want to, yeah. just to understand the mechanics. Sure. This isn't <laughs> like, is Action NYC broken? It's yeah, yeah, like, no, I understand. I think this, this simplest answer is it gets escalated to us. If there's any challenge, including if they were for some reason unable to access. So it's more of a flag, it's a flag protocol. So the, it's a protocol to flag any issues and then you kind of address them as you get them. Yeah, and then if it's a, and if it's a language specific issue, we work with our language services team um, to either work directly with the vendor and accessing an, uh, an individual or identifying separately somebody who can provide the translation support or service to the individual. Okay, we'll follow up on that. Sure. What are the hours of operation for Action NYC? Um, Action NYC, the hotline itself is available from uh, Monday to Friday uh, from nine to six and uh, we have a partnership with 311. So 311 is able to receive a call, give basic information and the information for hotline availability to a caller if they call outside of those time periods. Got it. And were the hours extended from, uh, were the hours extended when the proposed rule was published in 2018? It was not. Okay. Were the hours extended after the final rule was published? So, well, was it was it extended after last month's rule? It was not. In both okay. both instances, what we did, as I noted, was we worked uh, with a number of partners, um, including the ONA hotline, um, who has slightly extended hours to be able to transfer calls or provide service there. Um, we additionally and that's a three one one transfer. Three one one can also support that. Um, 311 is equipped with scripts to be able to give people information on when they couldn't call. And we did the phone banks, and the phone banks intentionally operate outside of normal hours uh, to be able to reach New Yorkers who, um, you know, use that opportunity with that sort of increased partnership with Univision in particular to get the word out so that people can call in. I'm going to pause here for Action NYC questions. I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Rivera's not here, Moya. For questions, thank, thank you. There's a dem conference happening too, so I'm, we're going to go through as thank many. Thank you questions. so much, uh, Chairman. Thank you, of course, to uh, the panel for being here and and the support that's been given. Uh, just in the uh, pre-considered intro that that I've put in, uh, which requires the dissemination of information about the city's uh, funded emergency food program. Under what circumstances does the Department of Social Services uh, share information about emergency food program and food pantries across the city? Sure, thank you for your question. So normally today, any uh, anyone who wants to, to have access to an EFAP provider can call 311, uh, provide their information address, and 311 will give them their, more, their local uh, food pantry. Um, and is, I'm, I'm sorry, is this information 
uh, available on the DSS website? It is, our information is on the website. Okay, and is it searchable by location of the individual? I, I have to remember how it's searchable, but all of our pantries are there. Okay, um, and also, as we know, in uh, this administration released a fact sheet on SNAP, mm -hmm. uh, enrollment trends in New York City, uh, the fact sheet showed shrinking SNAP uh, caseloads among non-citizens, uh, non-citizen New Yorkers, uh, beginning in uh, 2017. In light of this data, uh, what investments has the administration made uh, to the city's uh, emergency food program? So uh, I have to say that in partnership with the city council, we've already made a number of investments in the EFAP program. Uh, really unprecedented investments in the EFAP program. We stay in touch with our EFAP providers to ensure that they have enough uh, for the communities that they serve. Uh, as a byproduct of the public charge for the last 18 months, we ensure that anything that comes out in the news is there an impact on EFAP, and we haven't seen such an impact. Okay. Um, and has the administration provided information on about public charge and SNAP enrollments to the emergency food providers? So uh, it is our practice that any time we put out any information, all of our providers will receive it as well. So not just our EFAP providers, our HASA providers, our employment vendors, all of them will receive information on public charge and have received information on public charge. I'll add to that that we did a series of um, briefings with stakeholders that work with different populations that we believe would be impacted, including health, food safety, immigration, um, of which invitations went out to these same providers. So we've been in regular contact with folks since the proposed right. rule, including offering in-person uh, briefings for our, the providers that we work with. Great, and as, as you're collecting the data on how many uh, immigrants uh, are using SNAP, uh, and other government programs, it, has it been declining or has it grown? Do you want me to answer? You want to start? So we, as uh, the chair mentioned, we did, and a uh, commissioner mentioned, we did put out some information in June about those trends. Uh, we did see something that was very alarming, which is that non-citizens are uh, disenroll, not disenrolling, but not recertifying for SNAP at a higher rate than non-citizens, but I have to say that when we look at trends across the many years, including during the Obama administration, there has been a steady decline of SNAP usage, mainly because of the economy. Uh, so it is uh, something that we so track. That you're seeing that they're moving back, or they're just There's not been a steady decline of the caseload on SNAP since the, since Obama, uh, the Obama years, right? So we can't, particularly say that the decline is due to the administ this administration. Uh, it wasn't until we disaggregated the data that we saw that was a concerning trend among non-citizens. Yeah, I think to put a finer note on it as well, so, you know, in general, the overall case load, the administrator is speaking to positively, right? a decline in people needing and or choosing to use SNAP, and uh, obviously that correlates with economic growth. Right, and, so, right, okay. Right, um, and notably, and I think this is really key, especially as we talk publicly about why this is such, an, such a uh, horrendous proposal, people don't elect to participate in public benefit programs like SNAP unless they absolutely need to, right? I practiced immigration law for a very long time, over a decade. The clients who were participating in these programs were maybe somebody who's a domestic violence survivor and is in immediate need of assistance to get back on their feet, or to somebody who's transitioning uh, jobs in, in a difficult position or time in their lives. And so I think what's critically important is you, you've seen an overall decline in participation because that there's economic growth, which means people don't need it, and they're not electing to go after it or use it. What we've highlighted and noted and we think is important for purposes of our outreach and engagement with communities to understand what this is, is that the disparity between citizens and non-citizens and their choices to, choice to recertify has dramatically increased. So uh, we know that the, the recertification kind of rate, if you will, for non-citizens to citizens was about the same 
in the calendar year of 2016 to 2017, but we saw it grow dramatically in, in, in disparity in 17 to 18 and 18 to 19. By 18 to 19, there was an 8% difference when two years ago it was almost the same. So when we're looking at why that is happening, we don't have the exact pinpoint of why people are choosing to do it, but we recognize that that's when right. the leaked drafts of public charge came out yep. and the increased in immigration enforcement and so forth. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councilmember Moya. Uh, questions from sponsor uh, Cabrera first. No statement. Questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you uh, holding uh, this hearing. I uh, just have a few questions with regards to the, my pre-considered uh, intro. Uh, does uh, DSS H HRA currently have a unit that they believe will be best suited to respond to questions related to uh, benefits modification is so, which one? I, I'll start if that's okay, council member, um, to, to say a, a few things. One is that um, in partnership with all of you and many of the providers that are in the room today, you know, for the last year, we've really tried to understand how do we best combat this, right? Mm. How do we ensure that, as we know, the greatest impact here is gonna be people who really aren't gonna be impacted at all, but because of the fear and the confusion and the concern are gonna to choose to disenroll and there's gonna be this tremendous chilling effect. Um, and in speaking to community members directly and talking to some, many of the providers in this room and the ones that we work with regularly on this, the overarching challenge that we have as a city is to prevent that chilling. And our goals jointly have been to ensure that everybody that needs public benefits is getting it, that nobody is left hungry or without housing or without uh, health needs that they have and that we're moving towards addressing that as a whole. So what, we, what we've learned very directly around public charge is that uh, the thing that gives people the greatest confidence in not choosing to withdraw or forego those benefits is getting good immigration legal advice. That's true both in terms of our partnership and work with community members and providers, as well as through research that we conducted. Hmm. Um, and what we've uh, tried to balance is that anything that we set up as an administration, any step that we take forward, is one that continues to encourage the utilization of the benefits, Indeed. but directs people to that immigration legal advice when needed or if necessary. And I think that's really our goal in working with you guys around this, is to keep that at the center and core of how we uh, respond to and address what public charge is doing. And I'll turn to Administrator. For sure, so we don't have such a unit, and I think such a unit, as uh, the commissioner is pointing out, would not only go against everything this administration has tried to do to really increase access and create a welcoming environment at HRA, uh, it has been something that we are committed as part of our core values. A unit that would uh, create an atmosphere of like there's a reason why you shouldn't enroll, uh, it would not help us in that, in that, uh, in that effort. Uh, and additionally, like it's already been stated, it, if you're eligible for SNAP, there's a high likelihood that this rule will not affect you. And that is the message that we need to keep making sure our communities are hearing. And if there is any concern about that impact, the best place that you could go to is a legal provider that could look at your very specific issue and the makeup of your family so that you can make the most educated decision for your family as possible. Maybe uh, maybe the best way to move forward and appreciate uh, this dialogue uh, is to reframe how we look at that unit rather than uh, you know having the perspective to discourage people from receiving benefits is that they get the correct information, it's specialized. We live in a generation where people are looking for uh, information that comes with precision, that is accurate, uh, that also brings that level of comfort. Look, my, my, my wife is a first generation immigrant, came from Mexico, and I know all the fears that uh, her and her family went through. 
And there is something, you know, about a big, humongous agency that, is, to be honest, which is very fearful. Uh, and then there is something to be said about having to brand a unit where people feel safe. I think that that will make your agency just so much efficient, effective, and impactful. It's so, something to think about in terms so I, of the framing. I absolutely appreciate the intent by which this, uh, this was introduced. Uh, we believe that we have the best model possible today. Uh, when someone walks into any one of our offices to apply, um, our, what we do is we ensure that if there's any issue, if there's any concern, any doubt, that we're directing them to the people that are most appropriate, as you're stating, to, to answer those questions. And those are the providers that we've invested a great deal of resources in just to be able to respond to moments like this. I have to tell you uh, that the advocates uh, who are in the very front line and we appreciate all the work that they do, uh, they see a tremendous benefit of having a unit. Uh, and, and it's not to take away all the wonderful work that you do, again. Uh, but there are people out there who are very much apprehensive and scared uh, because they came from a government, many of them, uh, where basically you don't trust the government mm. in many of the countries they came from. So they, they're coming now with that level of experience and uh, so something to think about, let's continue the dialogue, Absolutely. appreciate, you know, let's stay open-minded about, you know, where we could go the next step uh, with this. I want to ask you one more question, Mr. Chair, can I ask one more question? Is that okay? I want you to take as much time as you need because this bill is very important. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it uh, to, uh, to the Chair. Um, has HRA or MOYA ever produced a guide or written guidance for community-based organizations about public benefit, uh, benefits? And have you historically partnered with CBOs to create guides on using HRA services? So we have a number of guides around our services and how to use them. Uh, I think that the best example that we have about our incredible partnership with our community-based organizations is the work that we've done around Access HRA. Uh, every time I go out into the community uh, to talk to our providers, the feedback that I get is that having that tool uh, by way of helping community members in a safe, reliable space that's smaller than a large agency has been a game changer for them. Uh, and that is the tool that we continue to use to make sure that providers understand how to apply for our benefits and assist uh, the clients that we mutually serve in applying for those benefits. I'll add a couple of things to that, which is to say um, two things. One is to say that we have in working closely with you all and advocates and others, really tried to, as I said, strike that right balance on this, right? And I think we're very open to continuing our conversation and make sure that we're at least speaking the same language about what would be most useful or what you what you have in mind or with the right advocate advocates who you've spoken to to understand kind of more specifically what, speak, what people are interested in. But I think directly echoing what you said, of course, sometimes there might be, as much as we all try to put our friendly city government faces on it, there might be concern interacting with city government. Frankly, our frontline staff at our agencies are not and will not be, in, in speaking candidly, the best qualified, nor is it fair to them to expect that they're most qualified in speaking about immigration law. Right? Immigration practitioners who have practiced immigration law for long periods of time this is complicated. We're actually working with experts to develop the training necessary for the existing practitioners to be able to be effectively responsible to this. We don't want to give bad information. We don't want to share bad information with anybody. We know that the best way to do that is to hyper-focus on the intersection of immigration law with people who are using public benefits and making sure that people are actually speaking to the immigration lawyers to get that advice and counsel and that we're not having staff that's not an expert in this area give bad advice. Secondly, I would say that can, the provider- Can I stop you there? Because maybe I'm, what I'm hearing is the, that the, the hesitation, and understandably so if this is the case, that what you're lacking then is uh, 
people with expertise to be able to handle these type of cases? I don't think we lack it. I think we're investing in it in the right place, which is the immigration and legal services providers that we work with. Um, and we're making sure that people who have those questions as they're seeking to util utilize public benefits are getting the advice there where it's rightly positioned. The second thing that I would add is that the provider community, Legal Aid Society, um, and, and others have been working to develop a tool that can assist those that do uh, public benefits administration, other stakeholders and navigators in the community that do that work, um, to see if there is a flag around public charge for the individual so that they can direct them accordingly. And again, these are the experts from the immigration lawyers who are who also are, ben are experts in public benefits who are helping to develop these kinds of tools to think about what's most effective as if the rule ever goes into effect. Um, my last question, thank you so much uh, for your response. What outreach is being done to communicate that, uh, being done to communities that do not have digital access? Thank you very much for the question. Smartphones, yep. computers. Fair. Yep, very important. Thank you for the question. Uh, a few different um, things. So one is ensuring that we're working closely with the press, community and ethnic media included, the phone bank being an example, which, would be which will be televised. Um, so uh, you can watch it from TV if you watch Univision, et cetera. Um, making sure that- Actually, I'm gonna be there. Sorry? I'm gonna be at that forum. Excellent. And we'll see I'm very happy for that. It'll be um, awesome. We welcome everybody's participation. Um, and uh, making sure that we're, we're using the medium that people are receiving information through in, in different languages and with different um, uh, community uh, papers or television providers, et cetera. Um, the second is on the ground. So working with our own community partners that we work with, as I said, we've done a numerous stakeholder briefings, but even more broadly shared information, including flyers in different languages with over 9,000 community providers that we work with so that people have good information to share with people that they're interacting with. We've done a convening and engagement with houses of worship so um, both in terms of educating leadership in the clergy and elsewhere, um, but also being on the ground and offering to send our staff or personnel, I've been out, I know Grace has been out, and others um, to join uh, at, at houses of worship and share good information to pass out literature and to have that available. We've also done, as I noted in my testimony, days of action at grocery stores. We focused that actually on grocery stores specifically and on a weekend on Sunday because that's when families are doing their shopping and maybe using SNAP benefits or other, um, or other uh, services. So making sure we're engaging on the ground in community. Um, at our health and hospitals, there's signage up as well, and, and there's been flyers and other resources that are shared um, as people are coming through the public hospitals. We're definitely open to new ideas, but those are some of the ways that we've been on the ground and making sure that those who don't have the digital access are still getting the information. And Dad, uh, appreciate uh, the work in Univision that is gonna be doing and everything that you mentioned does, is that at the same level in all of the people groups? For example, I, I chaired the government operations and one of the people groups that sometimes they're not getting uh, equal services, the Asian community. Yep. And so I, I'm just curious as to everything that you mentioned uh, just previously here in the last couple of minutes, does that transcend into the Asian community at the same level, so for example, in the uh, Latino X community? Yeah, it just looks different. It's a great question and it just looks different. So mm -hmm. the Asian American Federation has been a great leader on this. They've held with our, in partnership with us um, and ones in which we've joined multiple um, community and ethnic media roundtables, um, having uh, not only inv inviting um, press that um, represent different Asian community um, outlets, but also ensuring that there are providers that speak different languages presenting on the issue there. Um, we have, uh, because 
uh, we've seen uh, an increased concern, particularly among Asian populations, made sure that we've actually translated our materials in more languages. Um, and our, if, we're, if something isn't available, if people visit nyc.gov slash public charge and see something missing or would like something translated into a different language, just let us know so that we can um, ensure that we're doing that. Um, we've also engaged broadly with different uh, providers, our uh, press outlets and providers ourselves in ensuring that we're sharing this information out. And when we do the on the ground community um, engagement, of course, that's where we're looking at sort of the diversity across all five boroughs in different communities. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to having an offline uh, conversation. And Mr. Chair, thank you for allowing uh, this vast amount of time. Uh, Thank you. Well, this is important, and, and I have some follow-ups on your bill. I Please. think what's important here is that we clarify the step process yeah. between the community, the nonprofit, Action NYC, and HRA. And I think what, what, how I'm understanding it, and this is where I want clarity from, your, from the admin, is that we're not asking HRA to do any legal advice whatsoever. What we're saying is there's going to be a moment after uh, a New Yorker goes to a nonprofit that then refers them to Action NYC and a, law, a lawyer will review the case, they're going to have to make some decisions. Some of them will be needing to modify and make modifications on their benefits. At that point, this is where the bill becomes incredibly important to build out a unit within HRA to handle that flow of cases so that the nonprofit can then speak to someone dedicated, trained, and being able to with uh, confidence and training, engage that modification and that process. And I think that's where we're dedicated. And look, this has been an ongoing conversation in general. We're not just talking about immigrants. We're trying to make HRA even better. It's the largest organization of its kind. It's an incredible organization. It feeds and does so much to the communities that we represent. And, and so that's what we're trying to talk about. And so I'm, I'm not sure that we, we got that flow, and so I want you to maybe respond to that. This is not about legal, service, uh, legal services sure. at the HRA front. This is about after someone has already spoken to a lawyer, they're gonna have to, they may have to modify something at HRA. That's where this bill comes in. That unit makes that happen with focus. So I have to say that that work already takes place. Well, tell uh, us about it. I so absolutely. So there are a number of ways that someone can disenroll from our benefits. Uh, if you are on Access HRA, you could actually do it right on Access HRA and say that you no longer want those benefits. If are you, you saying online? You could do it online through Access HRA if you're disenrolling from SNAP benefits. Uh, if you want to come in, because even though we tell many people there's no need to come in, they want to come in, they want to speak to someone who is has some level of authority over their case in their in their mind. We our offices are open. People come in. They let us know they want to disenroll. If you want to do it by mail, that also takes place. So there are many avenues currently where the public at large can disenroll. Um, I appreciate the intent of this bill and try to make sure that we're hyper-focused on this community. We honestly believe that we are. And disenrolling, that is the easiest thing. The th hard thing here is sending the message that the majority of people that are on SNAP are probably never gonna be affected by this bill, right? So that's what I would hope that we together can partner well, to make sure we're that we're sending we send that, message. that message. We're definitely sending that message clearly. Um, Commissioner, do you wanna respond before I? Yeah, I guess also, um, the scenario that you're describing maybe isn't also clear, crystallized for us, um, and maybe that's something that we can continue to have a conversation yeah, let's, around let's offline. Get this, let's get this clear. Yeah. Let's get this clear now. We can certainly try, but again, in terms of like what what is going to impact your immigration case, if you're talking about the enumerated benefits, you're talking about mm -hmm. um, primarily in terms of the change SNAP, right? And so, as the Adm administrator Bonia described. The modification is that you're choosing not to recertify or you're choosing to disenroll. And I think what we what we know is there's a lot of entry points and ability for people to choose to not recertify or to disenroll 
um, from one of these benefits. That already exists, it exists in person and it exists online. And our hyper focus is to make sure that if you have questions or you raise questions about the impact on immigration status that we're directing you the other way, which doesn't seem to be what you guys are focused on here. No, because everyone's going to consent to yep. the, uh, the robust legal service provider infrastructure that we've been building over many, many years now. And I guess what we're trying to get to is, is that moment where HRA, well, and does HRA provide a guide to community uh, service organizations uh, on how to do what we're talking about, disenrolling and engaging in a modification of, of benefits? So it's a does that exist? It's a conversation that we have with our providers in the event that a client no longer wants our benefits. These are the enumerated, enumerated ways that they can contact us to close their benefits. Uh, the other thing that I, I would not want to do, especially in this climate, is to have an office specifically for immigrants. That is not how we look at our services. We I don't think that's what we're doing, right? I don't know. Absolutely not. And, and, and part of the uh, issue here, Mr. Chairman, uh, is that, as I understand it, it's digitized, right? You go to an HR center, it's dig digitized, and it's in English. Uh, what we're hoping is a uh, one-to-one -one contact uh, with a person who's culturally sensitive, uh, who would be able to speak the language, and have the environment where people, you know, feel safe, which is the the... I think that's the branding. We're not looking for that branding you're talking about. This type of branding, I think, will be very welcoming and, um, and I think, productive. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep talking. Sure. I think we made our, our points clear. Uh, does Action NYC need additional resources, such as funding, staff, interpretation, or equipment? Um, we've... We are monitoring Action NYC. As I said at, the, at this moment in time, we're not outside of uh, concern in terms of the hotline. What we did do, and this has been in anticipation of this and in response to what we were seeing in terms of callers and being efficient in terms of triaging, was we added uh, immigration counselors to the hotline. So it's not just people who can um, incredibly assist in making appointments and helping figure out if that's what you need, but also helping to answer some of your questions immediately without taking an appointment if you don't need one. So that's huge, um, and that's already in place, um, and we're, we've been growing that capacity. Um, the additional thing is uh, we worked closely with the Robin Hood Foundation and now Legal Aid Society and New York Legal Assistance Group in thinking through what might be a spike that we see um, at this particular juncture where there's a, a lot of initial questions and maybe immediately after um, a rule if it ever goes into effect. Um, and just making sure that, again, if there's an urgency in a particular matter or a particular case, uh, that we can address it as in a timely fashion. And so there's increased capacity now with the support of the Robin Hood Foundation with those providers for us to be able to tri triage that. So we feel good with what we have set up now, but we're gonna continue to monitor it uh, and ensure that we're addressing the needs and that there isn't an outstanding one. Okay, and we'll be in open conversations about that just okay. so that we can ensure that we can be supportive of that. Great. Uh, this kind of begs a series of questions around Action NYC and the process itself. You're adding kind of pieces to make it better. And so we have a, a, a kind of series of questions that kind of get us on record about how it works. And if someone calls the hotline, Action NYC hotline, with a question about public charge, are they immediately connected to someone or must they leave a voicemail? If they call during the operating hours, they're connected with somebody. Immediately connected to someone? Yes. Okay, and if they must leave a voicemail for some reason, like calling outside the hours, how long do they wait to speak to someone? They're advised if they call to call back during the hours. To no voicemail, no. call back. Yes. And that happens in English and Spanish and all languages? How does Mul that? In multiple languages. How many languages? I think it's three, but I want to confirm and get back to you. Okay, get back to us on that. Yeah. Um, if the, is the person they speak to prepared to do a preliminary screening related to public charge at that moment of that first call? That's when we have the immigration counselors who That's when that came a in. public charge flag. They can come in and do that screening. After they say public charge? Yeah. I mean, they're going to ask the person why they, you know, 
what do they need? Um, and if it's if they're just offering that they need an immigration appointment, right? We're not going to question them. We're going to give them that appointment. Uh, but if they are indicating to us that there's a public benefits question or a public charge specific question, we'll ensure that they can get that screening on the phone. So an attorney is connected immediately after either they say, I need an attorney, great, we'll, we'll set you up with one, or a screening of sorts happens and they say, you know what, I think you need to talk to a lawyer. Yeah, Let's they, and the you. counselor is available then to be able to speak with them. So it's essentially immediately after that first call and a connection has been made around public charge. Yep. Okay. How long does it typically take for, from the initial mm -hmm. call to connect with an attorney? to get connected to an attorney? It depends. Um, it depends on, you know, people are asked, uh, the, try to identify the urgency of a particular matter, or if it's, um, you know, if I wanna go in my borough, um, or I'm willing to travel. Um, so it, it depends on uh, a number of things. People are, you know, happy kind of waiting because they want to go to the provider that's immediately in their community. They might wait a few extra weeks if they want to go to uh, something more immediate. Um, even if our hotline doesn't immediately have the availability, but there's urgency, we work with the provider to, to get the person fit in right away. So I'm looking for timeline and range of time. So I get the, the options here. So it depends, yeah, is my what, best answer. But Is I, there data, is there like typically um, people are asking for borough and it takes this We release time. new appointments every week. Okay, Right. So there's no data. So this is all kind of like, this is the process. I kind of want We have, no, 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 we do. We have some data and we can share it with you. But what I'm trying okay. to say is, it, if no, you I tell me if depends. I want an appointment in Brooklyn, right, it might look different than totally. if you're not right. But I, I, I still, after these questions, have no idea whether it takes a month in the borough and two months outside. Like, I have no sense of that range. That's what I'm looking for. And we can get back to you in terms of the ranges. Awesome. Thank you. Is there any reporting after connection is made with an attorney to track the status of that individual's case? And if yes, please state in which um, publicly available report this information is available in, if there is one. Um, we don't track the status of the, of the individual who called our um, our providers have uh, systems in which they're inputting uh, first sort of what happens with each caller, right? Um, so an appointment was made or information was given, et cetera. Um, and then the service provider for whom the transfer, the appointment was made is the one that has the case and is tracking the specificity of the individual appointment. Okay. Uh, no tracking but your providers have a sense of, of that? We're tracking why people are calling and if, and if an appointment was made, but not the detail of your name, right? So that's not right. being uh, tracked. That does, gets does tracked Ona when the case gets opened up for you at a particular provider's location. Yeah, no, and that, that gives some data, which yep. is, which is yep. important. Yep. It's, it's the, the tracking of the status and yep. ensuring that someone's kind of closed the case. Yep. Um, that I'm just kind of, is there anybody else that does that, like ONA or any other hotlines that kind of track the status? That it, well, Catholic Charities is going to be, I Catholic think, Charities here. is here. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk to them. I'll talk so to I'm them. I'm sure you can ask them specific ONA questions. We will, we will ask them. Sorry about that. <laughs> sure, no worries. Uh, I have one more set of questions, but I want to bring it back to uh, our Council Member 11, who has a pre-considered reso. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Administrator. <clears throat> I just want to talk for a second about um, uh, kind of how you're going to continue to evaluate um, uh, the impact of what the public charge rule could have. Um, so first off, in terms of economic impact to the city, um, have we've done an assessment or you've done an assessment around what you think the direct economic impact will be and then the indirect economic impact will be? And you can speak to that. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, when the NPRM or the proposed rule was issued last fall, we did conduct an analysis in partnership with our Office for Economic Opportunity and um, our colleagues at DSS uh, to look at impact. Um, and. I would note that the final rule, which was just published less than a month ago, is over 800 pages. There's a lot of open questions around mm -hmm. its application right. and what it will actually look like in practice. 
um, and so we don't have updated numbers yet. Um, at, uh, but at that time, we estimated that hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers could be impacted and with particular emphasis on the chilling effect of New mm -hmm. Yorkers who yep. might think they're impacted or have fear or confusion and choose to withdraw. We not only looked at people, but also economic activity, and we estimated that at least $420 million in economic losses to New York City could be seen. Um, annually, or? Yes, annually. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, this was based on the proposed rule and some preliminary analysis that we looked at. Um, notably, we did present um, on our findings to the federal government's OMB office. Um. I should probably know this, but do we have a sense of what percentage of our overall city's economy that is? Do you know the $400 um, million? Oh God, I could look that I'm up. not but. the economics person in the room. Um, uh, it, it is, I, it, I don't think it's a huge percentage of the city's overall economy. What right. I would say, though, even if it's Even if it's a half a percent or a percent, yeah. that's, a, that's, yeah. that's serious. So. Yeah. We based this analysis on estimates of, of how many, uh, what percentage of people might choose to forego, for example, SNAP assistance. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, narrow. And even despite it being that narrow, mm -hmm. you're talking about not just the uh, direct cost right. of the SNAP benefit itself, but the economic multiplier mm -hmm. in our small businesses, in our grocery stores, in our communities, course, right? Yeah. Um, and all of that has has an impact, right? Mm -hmm. It matters both in terms of individual families, but also the economic activity of the city. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, what, how are we creating um, now the structure of a monitoring uh, what kind of impact this will have uh, over at, at HRA or DSS in terms of how we're kind of uh, week to week um, and as granular as possible, whether it's through um, community board level or uh, zip code or however we're, we're looking to um, uh, delineate that. But ha how are we kind of creating the structure to, to monitor this and, and make sure that we are um, able to respond as quickly as possible where there's a need. Sure. So we are currently uh, reassessing the uh, analysis that we had released in June to see if there has been any change in our numbers. Um, I have to say that one of the challenges is that while we had a percentage that was that we thought was alarmingly high, it wouldn't be necessarily seen in the larger portion of the 1.5 million people that we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are refining those uh, those analyses as we speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but in terms but, of yeah, I in terms of like a framework sure. for how you're going to be tracking, like you know, week to week or month to month. Yeah, so I'll start a little bit in saying this, overarchingly, this is complicated and for good reason, mm -hmm. um, in that we, as a city as a whole, um, it's it's important and critical to us that we're not, uh, you know, we're not needlessly asking people questions around immigration or immigration status, um, whether when they're choosing to engage with our agencies mm -hmm. um, and or choosing to forego the use of a benefit. So the way that we're able to look at this and to track it is as we've done for over a year, is monitoring overall caseloads and then working really directly with frontline staff to get anecdotal information as well as the community providers and members that we've been working with mm -hmm. so that we can make adjustments as necessary either with uh, increased res resources or services or uh, ensuring that uh, communities have the right information through outreach and community engagement. The preliminary way that we monitored this uh, after we did the preliminary analysis and monitoring this, we let a little bit of time go, and then DSS did an overarching look at their whole caseload mm -hmm. to be able to try and isolate what was happening, and the best way to do that was to look at the non-citizen versus the citizen population. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where you saw our immediate sort of release in showing that there was about 25,000 individuals that we saw uh, foregoing the utilization of SNAP benefits that may otherwise have continued to or been able to continue utilizing them. So 
that is an example of how we have been monitoring and how uh, our intention in terms of kind of moving forward what we're doing. Moya works in coordination with the key uh, impacted agencies on the monitoring and have regular check-ins and calls to see uh, kind of how, what people are hearing and or seeing and if there are ways that we can better understand the caseloads. Um, uh, have we given, and this, I'm sorry if this was asked before, but have we given thought to how we will engage um, various media in impacted communities, whether it's through radio, yeah. subway, um, uh, print media, online media, um, how, and, and you know, how we can make that in different languages. I think Council Member uh, Cabrera asked that oh, I'm earlier. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. He so did. We'll I will just add one thing that I didn't speak to earlier, which is after we saw the, um, the SNAP uh, data, we did do a series of targeted ads in community and epic media in different languages mm -hmm. um, to see if that was a way that we could more immediately uh, address maybe concerns or confusion and direct people to good information. And mm -hmm. so, again, that's something that we're continuing to look at in terms of ways to be effective and to be immediately responsive as we see impact. Okay. Thank you very much, and I appreciate all the work you're all doing on this. And, um, you know, we'll have to continue to work together to, um, to fight this really outrageous um, infringement on, on uh, Americans' rights. Um, this is really a, um, it's a very distressing development uh, for us as a, as a country and, um, and I think it's right that we as a city um, stand up with, with uh, clarity um, in solidarity with our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Uh, please explain the trainings in your testimony that you talked about public charge rule uh, that you've conducted from August 2019 to the present. Uh, who conducted the trainings? How were they conducted over the phone, in person? Which agencies were included in the training? The um, agency trainings specifically? Yeah, the agencies, yeah, all, all of the, the trainings. I, you're, 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 um, Uh, expansive. Uh, you referred to kind of mitigation and planning with city agencies and partners. Can you just describe exactly what those trainings were uh, in person and phone? How many employees were trained? How were they selected for the training? Was the training voluntary? That kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll come in with more. Sure. Calls. I'll start high level and then um, have my sister agency speak to the agency specific level. Okay. So high level, we formed a working group um, over a year ago um, uh, that was led by Moya, but in partnership with DSS and h, &H um, HPD, NYCHA, and others who would be more immediately impacted. Um, the uh, trainings that were conducted included um, sort of the initial analysis of the rule the proposed rule at the time and now the final rule, um, what, it's in, uh, what the initial analysis looked like, how, what the changes were in terms of immigration practice, um, and what resources would be available uh, to the agencies to be able to support New Yorkers as they um, had questions or were coming through. We worked with the core group of agencies to talk through the specific agency resources and share best practices amongst each other in terms of uh, messages um, shared out, trainings delivered to staff, materials developed, et cetera. Um, we worked with a much broader, larger pool of agencies to share the top line information, the resources, toolkits, um, and more. We've done that both in the proposed stage and now in the final stage, including agency memos that have um, talking points and, and kind of an FAQ. Moya conducted all of this? Yeah, yes, in partnership with the uh, sister agencies, in, with our kind of core group, if you will. I'm flanked by two of them. Um, but why don't you right. guys speak to... Well, and still on top level, uh, was this like an email memo that was sent out? Was this a phone call? Was it, how was that? Um, the, the trainings and briefings, regular calls took place, um, and uh, 
we, we, we did also in-person um, uh, briefings. We then shared via email materials and then a broader agency memo that was more specific and then individual agencies uh, either took from that um, and developed their own materials or shared that out uh, broadly to the right staff amongst them. But I'll let these well, guys. Can you, can you pull out exactly what happened after August 2019? So it's a, mm. this is like the last year. Is there is there anything that you can point to that, that happened after 2019 and and that'll be for everyone else because i think we got a lot of that through the last hearing sure so let's just focus on august post august 2019 sure we did an immediate email that indicated that the final rule had been issued um and then scheduled i believe it was two days later a, a call um with a large a uh, group of agencies, and in the interim, the smaller group of agencies that I noted, so the small working group being the core impacted agencies like DSS and h, &H who we were daily working with from the beginning of the publication of the rule and doing a shared analysis of, um, uh, and then developing the broader uh, training and briefing for all of our sister agencies, which as I said, took place a couple of days later. I think it was the Wednesday or Thursday of the same week that the rule was published. Um, from there, we disseminated a follow-up email um, and uh, links to resources as we had them available. We had been updating our nyc.gov slash public charge page um, with immediate information and updated flyers as we were developing them and having them translated. Um, and so that was immediately shared out. Um, and then collaboratively, we worked on a larger agency memo um, that, was, uh, that was shared, uh, I think, a few days after that. It has since been shared. Uh, maybe a week later, when further analysis of the rule itself um, occurred and uh, we had the more of the response, including the resources, the digital toolkit, et cetera, in place for all of the agencies to be able to pull from and utilize. Um, so that kind of top lines since the proposed rule uh, in mid-August. And I'll let these guys talk to specific agency responses. Before, before they go. Oh, sorry. Um, still on uh, me. Great. You're still, you're still on really quick. Uh, <laughs> it, was there a sense of how many people got touched and in what ways? So was there like a, you know, these, fo these many people read emails, these many people got phone calls. Is there a sense of, of how, how robust? You're, and you're just talking about agencies, right? You're not talking about stakeholders broadly? Outside of city agencies? Yeah. No, just yeah, city agencies. Just the city agencies. Just we can on city share, agencies. I don't remember the number of agencies that called into the briefing, but we can share that with Great. you and the number that were invited to that. Um, and then we don't have how many opened the email, but um, I will say it, the agencies have been really remarkable in that they've been hugely engaged on this, even what the ones that are not immediately or directly impacted but understand how critical this is, have asked for one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm, I'm just talking top lines. That doesn't include the, in, the daily sort of back and forth, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the sharing of best practices um, that we've been doing, not only last year, but since the final rule was published in August with agencies from DIFTA to Mayor's Office Physical Disability uh, to DSS and uh, HNH and DOE and others. So it's a, it's a large list. We can share the number of agencies that have been participating. Great, and we wanna, we wanna share that same yep. sentiment of appreciation uh, yep. and just like the, the information and data. And then the, finally, before your sister agencies go, and speak to this question, are there any trainings that are scheduled before uh, October 15th? Are there anything, is there anything on the calendar right now that you have prepped and ready to go? And what, what is that? Sure, um, we don't have anything scheduled yet, uh, sort of from Moya at the t on the kind of top lines for agencies. A number of the agencies, I think I spoke to this, have have trainings scheduled that are working with our team to help develop. Um, so I'll, I'll, I don't have those dates, but I'll let these guys speak to them if they have them. Um, and uh, we are looking at October 15th and um, thinking through all the pieces that we want to make sure are in place if the rule is to go into effect at that time. We uh, believe that this is 
uh, a rule that has many legal issues in it and have legally challenged it. I agree. And to believe that uh, we are hopeful that there could be a delay um, in that 15th date. We've also talked to Catholic Charities and our phone bank partners about um, possibly doing a second uh, phone bank closer to the date, depending on sort of what we see um, transpire. So yes, we, our eyes are on the 15th and we're thinking through everything that needs to be in place um, before that date and when we need to make the decisions on that if there isn't an immediate delay in the implementation. Wonderful. Thank now you. your sister agency is going. So uh, at HRA, we were in touch with Moya as soon as we knew that uh, the rule was published. Uh, usually what happens is that our legal teams huddle up to get an interpretation of like what, what is the impact. The same week uh, that the rule was published, Commissioner Banks sent out an uh, agency-wide email to HRA, DSS, DHS that hits about 17,000 employees across the three, our three branches. Uh, we follow up normally from uh, the HRA side, we will follow up uh, with conversations and multiple emails to our providers to make sure that they also know what's going on. The main message for us is that nothing has changed, that we're open for business, that we should continue to speak to clients and allow them to apply, and that in the event that a, an, a client is feeling uneasy about application, uh, uh, an application for benefits because it could affect their immigration status, that they should turn uh, advise them to go to Action NYC. And I guess my my only ask for clarifying is is a specific concept around training. So this is kind of info, which is great. Yep. Uh, and maybe that's what you want to consider as training, but is there any training that happened after August 2019? Absolutely. So that is our immediate response. Right? Okay. What follows up with that is that we have already agency trainings that happen on a daily basis because of all of the changes in... And these are public charge trainings? These are normal tra uh, trainings, normal uh, course of events uh, for changes on forms from the state, a number of things. So what we've done is we've infused the public charge topic into those trainings. Uh, our team from Mariah has also gone out to speak to, to staff to also talk about the impact of this, of this uh, rule on our ser services, but it's already things that we have scheduled and we include public charge into that schedule. Can you share that with us too? What, what's, what's interesting for us is trying to understand how we get to the goal. I think we're trying to do this in multiple ways and we want to understand is, is uh, frontline and how you define frontline. Were any of these people that you just referred to frontline staff? Um, how how are they trained? Because we definitely have a, a, a we're, we're seeing some divide here in how we can kind of conquer the ultimate question about getting everyone trained and with some with some oversight. Uh, sure. And and so if there's anything that you can kind of point to with um, who they who got trained, were they frontline staff, uh, and are these trainings for all your frontline staff that you're talking about? So these trainings are for all frontline staff. We identify frontline staff as client-facing staff. So these are the, the staff that would interact with clients when they apply for these benefits. Uh, we also make sure that we have briefings for the directors of our centers and, their su and, the, and the folks that are the supervisors of the staff. So frontline for us is client-facing for you, and that's the same thing essentially that we're, okay, and we can come back yeah. to that uh, question. Okay, uh, Mr. Keeley. Yeah, Post it, August 2019, if you can just focus on that, thank you. Right, so after the final rule was uh, released within the first week, uh, may have even been within the first 24 hours, I think, um, Dr. Mitch Katz, our CEO and president, released an all staff email that goes out to somewhere between 35 and 40,000 health and hospital staff, in that he restated our commitment. Nothing has changed yet, the doors are open. This does not, the key messages where this does not impact all New Yorkers, this does not impact all immigrant New Yorkers, this does not impact all patients of health in hospitals. We really tried to, from the very beginning, underscore that message of this sounds and is intentionally being sold as much scarier than it is. This is a very, this is a horrific policy, it's, it's an inhumane policy, uh, but it's not as broad as it's being packaged and sold to be. Um, and so what our core messages to our staff are, what our core messages that we're trying to get out to our patients is, is take a breath. 
We don't know if this impacts you. What we want to do is make sure that you get connected with the resources that you need. Those are the legal resource, uh, legal service resources. We have them available on site at all of our hospitals, a number of our community clinics, our post-acute care you know, nursing homes. We have them available um, uh, upwards of 30 clinics per week in partnership with so our friends at Highlight and Legal and Health. And ask us if you can focus on training, sure. uh, any specific training. So this is all still kind of information that pe people are getting and reading. I'm, I'm really looking for trainings that have happened since August 2019. Yeah, so when we're looking at the trainings is the key, as you're saying there, frontline staff. We want, as I said, sort of the broad universe of our staff to be top line familiar with just the, the terminology of public charge. But there's particular frontline staff that we expect are going to be getting those questions most routinely. So we think about social workers, we think about financial counselors, those are care managers. Those are the most common that we're looking to do trainings on. And so the, the, the folks that help to support and manage the financial counselors across our system, of which there's hundreds, um, we've done trainings for a, a, nearly all of them at this point, I would expect, if not since, all of them. Since August 2019. Since August, yes. Everyone got trained. And it's largely in the same way that HRA was describing, sort of using existing training opportunities, and what we've done is included um, included specific messaging around public charge, and it is the same message others are describing. It is not impacting everyone. If a patient has uh, a request uh, or a concern around public charge, get them connected with the legal resources so they can better understand if they're impacted, and if so, what might be the best choice for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member and Chen. There's, there's plenty more if you'd like to hear Yeah, we, I'm gonna follow up on, on all that you just said in terms of the, uh, the staff that were trained. Uh, it sounds like you do have a frontline staff definition, so we want to kind of get to that as well, because I think that's what our bills refer to, and so I want to make sure that we're understanding what those are and what they're what they're not as well, and so that's going to be important for follow up. Okay. Uh, I think most a lot of the bills kind of refer to that. Councilmember Chin. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to um, you know ask uh, about Councilmember Rivera's bill that uh, requires. Uh, the DOE to disseminate uh, accurate information on this public charge. So in this past year, um, have any kind of um, outreach to DOE? I just heard earlier that DOE was part of the, uh, the agency group. So has any kind of outreach done to them to get information out to parents, and teachers, and students? Uh, yes. Um, and in general, we work with the DOE on dissemination of sort of broad messaging around immigration and immigration policy um, and have uh, tried to refine and strengthen that over the course of this year. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head everything that they did following the proposed rule, but similar to um, my sister agencies here, there was messaging, as I recall, from the chancellor and messages that were just, uh, and flyers that were disseminated across the schools um, so that people had immediate access to what public, what is public charge if they're getting asked questions and how to direct parents or students. Um, we're working with DOE now at development of new materials um, given the final rule um, for dissemination as well. So there were initial information yes. that went out. So from that, was there any kind of, um, did you kind of track, like are there questions that came from parents, teachers, because of the information that was sent out? We didn't, certainly didn't come back to us in terms of a huge spike or increase of questions around public benefits utilization. I think part of that is, of course, because the messaging directs people to contact the immigration legal services provider, so our hotline as the immediate source for getting the advice, and so that's where we've been more focused in looking at uh, call callers, call volume, and then the, and then the issue if public charge is raised. Um, but we haven't heard necessarily from the from DOE or for, from specific schools or principals of increased uh, questions around this specifically. So in this next round, are could you work with DOE to find out? I mean, for them to really pay some attention to see if they are getting inquiries or questions you know from individual schools and also because 
oftentimes, I think a lot of us as immigrants, the, the students, uh, especially middle school and, sure. and even younger students, access to translator for their parents. And they probably are the one that's going to HRA to help their parents apply for benefits. Yeah. So it's really important to get to the student. Yeah. And then also with DOE, it's like um, also the uh, Community Education Council um, that represents yeah. different school district. Right. They should really you know, have information. So you're talking about from K-3 all the way right. to 12th grade, right. that that information need to get out to them. Yes, thank you for that. We agree. We're <laughs> we just want to make sure yes. DOE does yeah. their part yeah. because, you know, they represent, yeah. they, they have yeah. over a million students. The other question I want to ask is that I know you were talking about, you know, the top tier agency and Moyer is really taking the lead on it, which is great. So are there a, is there a deputy mayor that is really kind of overseeing um, this coordination, this effort? Has it rise up to that level? Um, it has risen to that level. There's not a single deputy mayor. Um, I think that speaks to the uh, significance and importance of this issue and how cross-cutting it is across our agencies. We actually convened all of the deputy mayors over a year ago um, in advance of the proposed rule to ensure that they were briefed, their, their uh, key staff at City Hall were briefed, they understood what this was, if it were to come down, and what our request was as Moya in activating um, their shops and helping to coordinate uh, agencies uh, across the administration. So all of the deputy mayor shops have been involved as a part of the working group, have been briefed and informed, and are continuously active um, as needed. I'd say the key two deputy mayors that have been the most engaged and the most involved include Deputy Mayor Thompson and previously Deputy Mayor uh, Palacio and her team. Great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Chin. Uh, and on DOE, has Moya done anything re relating to public forums with parents? Today is, I think, the first day of school for kids. It is. If anybody has kids, um, I hope Thursday. today was good. Uh, this week, right? Thursday. Thursday's first, um, and good luck. And I don't know why it's Thursdays, but yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, the, it's the short week. But the work that Moya is doing around parent engagement, is there anything you can kind of uh, point to post-2019, sure. August 2019? Sure. There's two places of ongoing work that we do, um, three really places of ongoing work that we do with parent engagement in which we, um, in the same way they sort of talk about infl infusing public charge into the work, we've done so there as well. Um, one is actually through Action NYC and with our partners at um, Make the Road and Catholic Charities um, in providing immigration legal clinics to schools, particularly ones where there's um, uh, pop populations um, that would most benefit of in having uh, Im immigration legal services come to the school um, and be provided. So we do that every year um, with both uh, returning to new s to schools and also entering new schools. And if there are schools that we don't work with or that you're interested in us working with, please share that with us um, so that we can engage properly um, there. And so obviously that's one important venue and there's a whole um, uh, uh, initiative led by uh, Make the Road and some of our other providers in doing outreach and engagement with the school very intimately in advance of those clinics and sharing information and getting information out. So that's one avenue. Um, another is that we do uh, uh, help facilitate both kind of city-focused fo or centered ones and some community-focused and centered ones, Know Your Rights forums within schools. Um, and work closely with um, community providers and also schools themselves in, in having in facilitating that. Often the parent coordinators are some of the best partners in making those happen and, and, and ensuring that parents are aware of them and, and having uh, uh, the community come uh, and get the information and share it. And we've been successful both in doing them in schools but also in, as I said, including um, not just public charge, but shifts in immigration policy that have happened or, in, or enforcement patterns to get good information out more broadly and using those opportunities as a way to do so. Um, and then finally, um, working with DOE uh, in sharing information 
uh, with principals, um, with uh, schools more broadly, um, and kind of hyper-focusing if there's specific uh, areas or needs that come arise. NYCHA. Yes. Uh, my bill would kind of encompass NYCHA. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard NYCHA, or maybe you have, or let's put that front and center. Is NYCHA... Have I heard how, of NYCHA? Is that what uh, <laughs> No, I, I meant more in this conversation. We're talking about DOE a lot. We talked about HRA uh, and uh, hospitals. I'm talking now, let's bring NYCHA to the front end and talk a little bit about the trainings around public charge conducted and the level of cooperation with NYCHA. Sure. Um, so uh, NYCHA and HPD have been a part of sort of that core group of agencies because of the specific benefits that they administer that would be impacted. So um, as agencies, they've been uh, not only engaged, but a part of sort of the core group in terms of analyzing and understanding impact and then ensuring that their, uh, their staff is um, receiving good and accurate information and resources. So NYCHA is a part of that group. Um, What's the level of cooperation there? Um, I'm, at the agency level, they've been great. They've been hugely yeah. cooperative. Um, and um, we have also trained our public engagement unit who uh, does housing support um, and tenant support advocacy uh, engagement and outreach on public charge. So they're aware of it and are able to support as they're doing individual cases as well. Okay. I'm winding down here. Uh, <laughs> state. Yes. What's your collaboration and conducted uh, information sharing with the state of New York? And that's an open question. Are you working with the state at all, with the governor's office, with any one of his agencies on anything relating to public charge? Yes, um, we're working with a lot of the agencies. Um, I think critically, we are partnered with the state in our litigation. Um, and so working very closely across all city and state agencies through litigation to ensure that we understand uh, uh, not only what is happening at the um, local level, but the state level, that, the, that as a whole, we are jointly um, uh, presenting the impact on our communities and our residents, um, and we're working very closely together to do so. We've also been in regular conversation with our state counterparts around impact um, and monitoring to make sure that we're sharing information in that regard. We've worked closely with ONA, both in terms of hotline partnership and referrals, uh, and also through things like the phone bank. Um, and so I think Certainly, I feel very good that there's a there's a strong partnership and that there's an open line of communication and dialogue. But I'll let these guys add. So, uh, from an HRA perspective, our oversights are OTDA, OCFS, and DOH, and we work very closely with them uh, to ensure that we're providing coordinated information to our staff to administer these benefits. We're in constant conversation. My understanding is that at the state level, just like we gather to see what the impact is, our state uh, partners are doing the same. And at Health and Hospitals, we were coordinating with the State Department of Health in particular because uh, one of the primary impacts that's connected to health is obviously uh, Medicaid being one of the enumerated benefits under the public charge rules. So we wanted to understand and make sure that we were fully aligned on the understanding with them around some of the nuances that are behind that. And it's been a very collaborative and productive uh, conversation with them. Okay, that's really good to hear. Uh, I know we're trying to do that also on census and some other things, and so things are looking good. Uh, so here's my final question and really a, a thought, because uh, we have two more panels. We want to hear from the advocates, especially in response to what we just heard today uh, as, we, as we finalize the strategy. Uh, there's a real difference here between information sharing, sending an email out to all your partners, and then training that we're trying to codify by law. And, and that's what's going to be at the crux of these continued negotiations with the bills. They all kind of speak to it very differently. And one of the, one of the uh, my bill actually uh, refers to a definition around appropriate employees, what we're calling frontline staff, what you're calling client facing. Uh, there's still a discrepancy in understanding what that means. And, and what, what I want to know as a kind of final final departing question that will be continued in conversation and negotiation is, if I'm someone who is going to an HRA facility 
and I speak to someone there, uh, just kind of walk in and the first person that I speak to, is that a client facing employee? Uh, because that's what you're using. We're using what we're gonna reconfigure appropriate employee, but what we want are, are, are front facing. Uh, anyone who walks into any one of these facilities should be able to be trained and understand how to, how to send someone where they need to be sent and talk to the appropriate person. And we're all saying the same thing, talk to a lawyer. Talk to a lawyer, call a lawyer, call a lawyer today, right now. Call a lawyer, and we gave you two phone numbers to call. Sure. And, and so I think that's, I don't think the person I'm gonna walk into HRA who's gonna greet me at the door is a client-facing person. Unless, that, that, unless that's true, then we're good. And if not, then I wanna know. So what's the difference there? The first person that you're gonna greet many times is going to be our HRA police. Right, and in all things having to do with benefits, I don't think that's a client facing. And maybe, maybe the maybe, is that a client facing? We would consider them part of our customer service toolkit, right? So if a person, came but I didn't hear client facing. They would be considered client facing. They would be considered uh, client yes. facing. They would okay. be client. They would. This they is really important. Work with the public. They would normally, and I just want to put this in the context of delivering services from a public assistance perspective, right? If I walked in and I said, I need to apply for SNAP, I would be directed to a customer service person who's also a, a client-facing person, right? Um, if I decide to wait and not apply online, but I'm gonna wait for a caseworker or an eligibility specialist, that person is also a client-facing person. So from the moment you walk in the door, though all of those folks are part of our, of our client-facing community, right? right? What I wanna be clear about is that I wouldn't want our HRA police giving out immigration advice or saying even neither would I to, right okay, oh my god good. no way right but that's not what we're asking yeah. them to do so that <laughs> and that's that's would, I want you to yeah. be clear about that that's not what we're asking them to do but we want to make sure that they're trained so that they can send them to the right place to talk to someone at Action NYC or call the ONA hotline and be able to do that work so that person would normally send them to our customer service staff so that we can get a real clear understanding as to why that person walked in Right? Most people don't walk in and tell someone in uniform, I have questions about my immigration status. They usually walk in and say, where can I go and get a ticket so that I can apply for benefits? That first person you see in customer service would be that fir the, the first client-facing person that could provide you with the information of, you should call the hotline. Okay, and I guess, uh, what we want, well, I think we're, we're still not seeing eye to eye here, and we're gonna continue negotiations, but we want all the customer service people to be trained to be able to triage people to the right place. So part of that customer service line of defense that I talked about, right, so not the HRA police, but that next person that someone would see, which is usually part of our customer service group, those people are trained. They're trained in the same way that I described our eligibility specialists would be trained, right? They're and we don't want any of them giving legal advice. Correct. But we want to send, we want to train them to be able to go to Action NYC and, they are. and get to, and I think that's what our bills are saying. Yes. So, so we all agree that, that, and this is why we want to legislate this, so that we can, we can have a system that we can bring oversight to, to ensure that we know who's going to get trained, what they're going to get trained on. We're using the right words, customer service staff versus client facing staff etc and we'll continue the negotiations I've taken a lot of your time and I'm saying thank you and really appreciate the work I want the last note to be that we are incredibly confident because we have been building an incredible and robust system of access to every New Yorker and this is only to try to understand the final strategy because we have multiple bills here and that's uh, in, in a lot of ways, good to have an open discussion with our partners, wh which we're going to hear about and from next. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll get this right. I know we will. Okay. Thank you for your incredible patience here. This is like summer, trying to get through the summer ahead. Uh, Ms. Calhoun, New York Immigration Coalition, Rebecca Novick, Legal Aid Society, uh, Sarika Saxena, uh, the Bar Association, New York City Bar Association, and then Carolyn Cowan from the Chinese American Planning Council. If you're here, please come up. We want to hear from you. And we want to have a clock on, on the testimony. And as you get settled in, 
Thank you again, Commissioner. We're going to give three minutes on the clock. Uh, I know you have testimony, and we're going to read the testimony. But we all went through an incredible amount of detailed discussion. And what I'm, I want to, I want to ask you all to respond to anything that you kind of heard uh, from the testimony and Q and A, in terms of the bills, uh, in terms of strategy. And if there's anything that you can kind of point to that reflects flags that you need us to understand, we're negotiating four different pieces of legislation here that are going to inform the strategy. And, and I'm hoping that we can, we can kind of focus on that. I think we're all clear that public charge is horrible, um, that we're asking everyone to talk to a lawyer. And so I really want to kind of move through what I know is a collective understanding and hit us with questions, um, concerns, flags, and recommendations about bills, especially if they're not going to work for you all after now that you've kind of heard a little bit more about it. I want to hear about that too, or how they are going to actually help you have what you need so that you can get what you want from the agencies so that you can continue to provide services uh, and policy making. Uh, Ms. Calhoun is uh, Councilmember Menchaca and the entire Immigration Committee, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Claudia Calhoun. I'm the Senior Director of Immigrant Integration Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. We serve more than 200 immigrant-serving organizations across the state. Um, I, I, I think it's great to jump in and just talk about the, the opportunities and things we wanted to flag in reference to the four pieces of legislation. I definitely want to thank Council Members Cabrera and Moya Menchaca, Levin, and Rivera for introducing legislation to um, help advance the, the city's response. You know, I, w I think I'll skip forward to the things we wanted to say about the bills. I think the first thing, just to talk a little bit about the um, benefits modification unit and office, I, th I th think that we believe there's probably some function that having a, a a single hotline where people can call to ask questions about public benefits could that that could be very helpful and and if it was um, managed correctly and there was uh, there was good flow of information and some of the training questions were addressed it, it probably could augment the um, action NYC and Catholic charities um, function because public benefits are its own area of expertise and can be very complex and there could be coordination between those three. We don't endorse the idea of a unit. Um, I, I don't, I think that the issues that were raised about HRA, about customer service, about warmth, about accessibility, about trust, those are very real. Um, we are delighted to work on those issues with the council and, and with HRA and DSS, but I don't think setting up a unit, as it's been described, is actually going to be very effective in addressing that. I think it's a much broader systemic thing, and um, you won't be able to shoehorn the kind of tone and, and warmth th through the creation of a unit. Um, we want whatever HRA does to um, encourage people to stay in benefits they're eligible for. I was really heartened by the response I heard from, um, from both from HRA and from Moya about that. I think that's really important that we're on the same page about that. Um, so for the, so we look forward to working more on that piece for the legislation requiring distribution of information on local emergency feeding programs. I would like more clarity on what information is going to be mandated to be distributed, whether it's referral to EFAP. But I, I want to take this opportunity to say that what's much more important than the information that's being given out is the resources that EFAP providers have. And we, NYC does not work deeply in nutrition or food security, but what we've heard from EFAP providers is that without additional resources um, and without additional food supplies, there's no increase in capacity. And so you don't want to create a situation where we do a really great job of referring everyone to EFAP in a way that they can access, and then that system is overwhelmed. Um, I'll just say really 
bre so I think that monitoring of hunger is really, really important to have represented in, in the legislation. And I think that um, um, resources in the FY. 2021 budget are going to be really important. In terms of the educational materials, I think that it's great to send stuff out through the DOE. I would just broaden that. I think that there's um, all the other agencies could be also really useful, and and we would like, we would love to leverage that legislation as a way to mandate uh, coordinated large-scale flyer distribution. Um, sort of through a bunch of different agencies because we know that sometimes that doesn't happen unless there's a very clear mandate. And then finally, in terms of training, I really appreciated the training conversation. I, we came at it from a slightly different direction. I think what we would recommend is that all city employees determined to have an outreach or benefits enrollment function. So a benefits outreach or a benefits enrollment function would be required to complete a baseline training. I, I suspect the last bit of the conversation um, about the um, HRA uh, police personnel, like that made me realize that probably there will be different agency issues in terms of who receives the training. Um, so I think it would be good to come up with a standard to go that's statutory that holds, um, that hits the right note in terms of specificity around benefits, but doesn't necessarily tie the hands of agencies to create some sort of protocol that's gonna cause different problems than we have now. So that's it. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you to Chairperson Menchaca and the whole committee for your leadership uh, in fighting to preserve and enhance New York City's extraordinary reputation as a beacon to immigrants ar across the globe. My name is Rebecca Antar Novik. I'm the director of the Health Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Um, I also appreciate the, um, the instruction to just sort of jump into what um, is, you know, what we can accomplish on the, on the city level. Um, it, you know, is wonderful to see so many advocates, so many, um, so many uh, city representatives trying so hard to do what we can, um, what we can from here. We at Legal Aid have been working, um, our health law unit, our immigration law unit, our law reform unit have been working together um, to fight public charge in a variety of different ways, including filing litigation um, last week, um, along with the Center for Constitutional Rights and, um, and Paul Weiss, and um, have been working in training and outreach and, um, and advocacy for and advice for, for individual um, clients. We've worked with Make the Road and Empire Justice Center to develop a screening tool for for advocates, and it is um, in you know it it really is great to see what um, the council is doing in, in in trying to to make efforts on the city level. Um, just to speak um, specifically about the um, the legislation, we um, we also have concerns about um, Council Member Cabrera's bill um, and the disenrollment unit. I think a lot of our concerns have really been um, been raised already, but we are you know we are concerned about the potential. Um, chilling effect of the um, of the creation of this um, of this unit, and we, you know, like many others, are just are really encouraging people to get to an attorney to get to the Action um, NYC um, hotline. Um, we, um, you know, we we support uh, Councilmember Manchaka's bill for um, for requiring training. Um, we do recommend that the training include guidance for for agency workers so they don't inadvertently. Um, chill clients from accessing benefits by asking unnecessary questions about immigration status, social security numbers. I think those questions and that concern always comes from a good place, but um, one sentence that implies something that someone picks up on can, can really have a, um, a chilling effect. Um, we strongly support um, Council Member uh, Moya's bill. Um, we do want to sound a note of, of caution about the way in which the inclusion of information about the food programs could raise additional concerns about public charge. We would recommend that any information that's distributed by mail or email include information about how emergency food aid is not part of the public charge rule and information, again, about how to connect to um, immigration legal services. Um, you could keep going. Yeah, okay, let's thank finish you. The, 
the legislation comments. Um, and um, and just to, to make one uh, note about Council Member Rivera's bill, um, we you know strongly support the the um, provision of this um, uh, information through the schools. We believe that it is essential that that these um, educational materials are available in all the mandated languages so to make sure that non English speaking. Um, students and parents have access. Just to make one other um, brief comment, if I may, we um, we encourage the city to to fund legal services providers to who specialize in public charge issues. Um, as as has been mentioned today, one foundation is is funding some providers now, but we do believe that the the city should support these services for for immigrant New Yorkers. Um, we of course are hoping that the rule does not go into effect on October 15th, but if that does happen, um, of course the need is just going to to continue you to to grow and thank you very much for your time thank you hi um, hi I'm Sarah Kasixana I'm here on behalf of the immigration and nationality law committee at the New York City Bar Association um, thank you for holding this very important hearing I want to underscore what my uh, colleagues have been saying in terms of the support of the bills um, definitely you know uh, underscore that you know, the investment that the city has been making in programs like Action NYC um, and other citywide outreach efforts continue, especially, you know, the partnerships with community-based organizations as, you know, there's so much information out there, but what information is actually available in communities is, is really where the emphasis, I think, should be. But I think, you know, and, and as my colleagues were mentioning in terms of having, creating that unit, I understand sort of the, um, you know, the, the intention um, behind creating that, but I support my colleagues in, in opposing the creation of it. Um, we've all been a part of a lot of uh, working groups and, and committees just to sort of, you know, um, deal with sort of the, the, the gaps in sort of just how complicated this rule is um, and how, you know, sensitive it is to, for, for, for an agency like DSS to have a unit like that. Um, what I what I would want to add to this is just you know um, looking at the package that you've created. It's really great. You're trying to get the information out there, which is incredibly important, um, especially where you know things like emergency medical care could be um, mis you know mis there's already a lot of myth, a lot of rumors just accessing these benefits. So it's really important to emphasize that people should still go out and get medical uh, emergency medical care, and that it wouldn't come back and hurt them. I think that's really important to underscore and in the, those outreach efforts um, last you know I just I think the outreach and the awareness is incredible um, but also I think that the City Council should be considering the very real gap in medical access that will be a result of this new rule as it will impact low-income communities of color I know that there's been a lot talked about as how you know this rule is not going to have a broad effort you know broad uh, impact and things like that but there's, and, and, and practically speaking, for low-income communities, um, it, it, should, it should be limited, but it's, it's still gonna be pretty, it's still gonna be, it's not, you know, I don't wanna come from a place of fear, but there's gonna be a real impact, and it's going to impact the actual healthcare that people will be able to access, um, and just the way that they're going to be targeted because they are sick and not able to, um, access, you know, subsidized health care because they're going to be penalized specifically for that. At some point, there are going to be people making those calls um, that they're going to have to not do that or, you know, with food stamps and, and the like. Um, and then lastly, on the, uh, the DOE um, education materials that will be distributed, that's, obvi that's obviously great. Um, I think what needs to also be looked at is like a public education campaign um, because a lot of flyers and things that go home, you know, not all families uh, will be able to, you know, it's not, um, there is a literacy gap. There's a lot of gaps in, in information, and I think that um, you want to be able to get to people uh, in, in many different modes of contact, and especially when it comes to something as complicated as this, um, it needs to, I think, should be thought about in, in a larger way. That's all. Got it. So just I guess I could get a better sense or a kind of clarifying sense. Uh, a lot of concerns with Cabrera's bill and the um, education. When well, you support the rest, essentially. Oh yeah, absolutely. Every every all over. Okay, great. And then because we we want to maybe do some follow ups on on some of that. 
some of the things that you just commented on. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. CPC serves over 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low income New Yorkers each year, the exact communities that are already being impacted by this rule. I think as we talk about how the council responds and how the city responds, it's really important to center the lived experiences of our community members over the past two weeks, which have been seniors asking to de-enroll from their SNAP benefits, even though they rely on them to put food on the table. People asking about if they should stop their prescriptions that they're taking for chronic conditions because they're concerned about the impact. People asking if they'll be able to petition their family members to come over if they're still on public benefits. These are the things we need to be thinking about as we plan a citywide response. We have been very grateful to the city, especially uh, Moya, HRA, and DOHMH for their response to this and for how closely they've worked with advocates and community organizations, as well as to the council and particularly the Committee on Immigration for your work on this. Uh, as members of New York Immigration Coalition, we support their stances on all of these bills that have been proposed. Um, and to want to lift that messaging that they already shared in testimony. In addition, we think that there are a couple of things that we would like the council as well as the city to consider in response and in moving forward with these resolutions. Uh, the first is the Action NYC hotline or the uh, ONA hotline to extend those hours beyond nine to six. Many of our community members cannot call during those hours and the chilling effect and fear simply do not operate on a nine to five schedule. It's really important that people be able to access those hotlines when they need them. On that note, is there a uh, consensus about what hours would work? And if that's not a question that you can answer now, that's an overarching question for the community to give us. Because this is the time we change it. And this is the time where we can push it. Um, so that's just a question to hold. In an ideal world, it would be open 24 seven. Amen to that. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, but which is I'm why happy I want to ask about resources. More suggestions. No, and, and that's right. And, but in a world where, where we have resources that we can't get to immediately, and I think a 24 hour hotline can be one answer, um, it'd be good to get a sense about where we could prioritize the timeline for um, and in response to, you, to your request. Absolutely. Okay, sorry, keep going. Keep going. Of course. Uh, the second one is the importance of language access. Now, obviously, there has been a lot done on the city side as well as the council side to provide translated materials to have those ready quickly, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I went on the city public charge website. Uh, while sitting in the hearing, and the only information that's available in Chinese is a one-page flyer that refers back to the website in English for more information. We need to continue doing that outreach and working with community-based partners that have that language capacity and have the knowledge of how uh, community members need to hear this messaging in order to actually provide information in language. We have seen with the hotlines when the community members have called uh, either 311 or Action NYC that they wait to find an interpreter, that sometimes someone calls in Cantonese and gets sent to a Mandarin or a Japanese interpreter, um, and that often our staff are filling the gaps for interpretation for HRA, for 311. Um, and for other city agencies. This is obviously an ongoing issue beyond public charge that I know that you've been working on closely. Um, additionally, we really urge the city council as well as city agencies to partner closely with community-based organizations that are working with community members that are being impacted by this every day. And the particular reason I say that is because for community members, particularly limited English proficient ones, that have a lot of fear of a hostile federal government, there is no distinction between that federal government and a sanctuary city like New York City. So if something comes with a government seal, it's not seen as safe, it's seen as dangerous. We've had community members come into our centers because they had something that had a government seal and they are having a panic attack that it's something from ICE because they can't read the language it's in and it turns out to be a simple school notice. So it's really important that the city partner with community-based organizations that can say no, sources like 311, like Action NYC, like the ONA hotline are safe and you can trust them. Beyond that, we think it's really important that the city fund legal services providers that do this work, but beyond that, 
community-based organizations that can refer to those legal services providers. In times like these, we see brokers or notarios taking advantage of community members' fear, and we've seen an increase in them over the last couple of months in Flushing and Sunset Park in particular. It's really important that community-based organizations be able to do outreach, know your rights, as well as intake and referral to these legal services providers that are working so hard with such a huge caseload. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, are there have. any comments you have on the bills that were discussed today? I think the unit has been a, a topic of conversation. Uh, I think you've kind of pointed to training as good uh, and working with the Department of Education. So is there anything that you want to say on each of the bills? We completely agree with what uh, New York Immigration Coalition shared, where we have some concerns about the benefits de-enrollment unit. Um, but beyond that, we support the bills with some of the concerns echoed. OK. Thank you for that. So I have some questions uh, in general for this uh, panel. And I think, do we have one more panel? Huh? We have one more panel. And this is really in terms of, of the training uh, that my bill speaks to in terms of really creating a, uh, one, a, a kind of focused understanding about who gets trained where. So there might be some changes per agency. We, we don't want to create more problems um, um, than, than we have right now, but that there's a difference between sending out an email to your staff and doing some training. That there's, there's a quality difference in how you bring someone up to speed in terms of understanding not just public charge, but how to disseminate that information in real time to a person, which is why we're really focused on, on the training piece. Uh, and maybe this is more of a comment I'm trying to make here, and, and, and I think you support it. So let's just move on to the next question. The Cabrera Bill creates a unit. And what I'm trying to understand from all of you is that we're holding both the, 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 the kind of council members question about an agency that may not be prepared to take this on because of structural issues that are massive, and this unit would only kind of create a chilling effect for creating something. So I, I want you to just kind of go a step further and, and really kind of dictate to us what exactly would cause a chilling effect with a unit like this within HRA that can be focused on language access, that can be focused on training people, that can have a direct line for the pr service providers that often have issues with benefits, either getting on benefits because th they get routed from a Cantonese speaker to a Mandarin speaking person. Like there, there needs to be, so if, we, if, it, the, if the unit is not the answer, then what, what is the answer that we can provide oversight? Because we think that status quo might not get us where we want to get to. And so we, want, we really need your help to kind of think through that. And if you don't have any immediate answers now, that's great, but we're in the middle of negotiating with some rapid uh, timelines so that we can get things ready for October in case this happens. Okay, I think Anybody? these are, I can start. Th these are great questions. I think that um, one challenge with the unit would be, I think that the point that was made about having an office or a unit that's solely focused on um, immigrants is of, is of a concern, so it's sort of like, um, specifically stigmatizing. I think in term, when you're talking about a unit, I also think from a logistical perspective, what does that mean in practice? You know, HRA is dispersed across how many ever, how many ever different offices. So would there be one spot? Would there be one office where people would go to? That seems like that also could create just challenges in terms of access to those, to those services. I think what would be much more suited to the um, scope of the challenge in terms of, in terms of people, people within the group of people who have gotten appropriate guidance that they might want to think about disenrolling from some um, benefit, you, th those individuals need to be able to get the same quality of service in terms of that disenrollment at any office. And creating one place where they go for that level of service is um, gonna create, could create more barriers um, than the, the, a unit, can, than one single place can actually a, address. Um, I think the other piece of it is, is that by creating an office, the vast majority of people affected by the rule are affected by it in an indirect way, as opposed to 
you know, a direct, narrow way. And so we want HRA, we don't want HRA, and we don't want the council to believe that by addressing the needs of the narrow group, we have also addressed the needs of the broader group, um, which is, of course, the harder, you know, the, 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 the group of people that is not necessarily affected but is terrified. Um, and then I think the last thing that I, I think I didn't get to mention, but one thing that is a really practical thing that will be especially important, um, and it would be good to go through this with HRA and walk through exactly what happens, is disenrollment documentation and documentation of what people both have been judged to be eligible for and what they actually were enrolled in. Um, and we remain, we are concerned about how that's gonna work in practice for people who are like, well, I'm gonna be working on my green card application in a year, so I, and I'm gonna go off of these benefits, so I'm gonna need a letter from HRA saying that m this benefit ended on this date and that I was eligible for this other benefit, but I didn't actually ever take it. And so I think that in your negotiations with HRA, sort of understanding really clearly how that works in practice is, um, could, could be really critical in doing what Council Member Cabrera would like to see happen. And then the other thing is I, th I do think some sort, of, um, some sort of mechanism by which if people get stuck, they can, they can elevate those concerns. Like, and th that's where a helpline, an HRA helpline on benefits, on public charge benefits could be helpful. Again, with the caveat that it would need to be coordinated with uh, the Catholic Charities and 311. Super helpful. Any other one? Any other comments on this? Um, I I had one note that um, I'm that I realized wasn't I, I don't think was was discussed today, which is also um, that that I would just encourage you to include in your conversations, which is that um, for Medicaid, most people are on the exchange, and so disenrollment is not through HRA, and so I would so that coordination with the state. Um, would would be, I think, crucial in any conversations happening about disenrollments. This is something that advocates have discussed with um, with the state and have had good conversations. I think that things do actually tend to work fairly well in terms of disenrollments from the state. The other thing is, I feel I feel weird even bringing this up because honestly, with the final with the final rule, there are, is such a, a tiny sliver of people actually impacted on Medicaid. Um, because of the of the interaction of who's actually impacted and who was carved out of Medicaid, um, we're so from the health perspective, we're so much more worried about the chilling effect. Um, but obviously, for certain people, they are going to need to to disenroll. So I would just put that note in there. I think Claudia covered a lot of the the, the logistical and other concerns really well. Thank you. Um, yeah, just actually uh, to. Touch, I think this was mentioned earlier when the city, when the administration was testifying, but the Office of Refugee and Immigrant, like there is ORIA, and I think, um, you know, they are specialized in this. And I guess to me, I wasn't understanding what this other unit, like how it would be different and what its purpose would be. Um, but to just say that they, you know, they, that all, to me, my understanding was that that service already exists in terms of having a unit or an office that provides that level of expertise and, and has that um, um, capability to train and provide those trainings. Um, and I, I know that, you know, the, I think she was mentioning that earlier, but maybe didn't name the office, but yeah. So my concern about this bill is largely how community members would interact with the information should this office become reality and how they would interact with this office. Yes, I absolutely think there should be dedicated staff and funding at HRA to be responding to public charge, but the reality of it is if there is a unit that is focused on de-enrollment, my fear would frankly be that a lot of community members would hear that information and interpret it as uh, we need to disenroll from benefits because HRA is specifically creating resources around doing that rather than um, understand that HRA is, is trying to create specific support around this. Um, I also agree that a very narrow portion of the community members that we're seeing around this are actually going to need to be able to do that, technically speaking, but should be able to do it at any office that they go to. And a lot of times, CPC staff are actually going with them to those offices to serve as translators and to support them through that process. 
Um, I think that while people need to be able to de-enroll in a timely manner if they need to, and it's very important that they're able to get documentation on it, a lot of the resources uh, for city agencies should be focused on outreach, on education, on making sure that people are not de-enrolling if they don't need to, and then those that actually do need to make that decision with an immigration attorney have the ability to do so quickly at any location. Um, so I, I echo a lot of what was said. Thank you, thank you for that. I have one question about, can anyone comment on the guide for providers in the Cabrera bill? There's a piece in the bill that talks about a guide. It may have um, uh, gone unnoticed. Well, we can follow up with you. Uh, we want to kind of, because there's a couple pieces in it, and one of them is a unit, another is a guide. Uh, one of the questions that we asked earlier, does HRA have a guide for providers so that they understand exactly what the process is and, and whatnot? So um, this is tricky. This is cl clearly tricky, but we are hearing you, and I hope that you feel confident that we're listening to that uh, sentiment and uh, concern. And is there anybody here from Moya or from HRA? HRA, Moya, okay. Moya, thank you for being here. They're here and they're listening as well. Thank you. Can I, can I just add quickly on the guide? I'm sorry, I don't, I on the guide. don't want to speak for the others, but we did look at that part. I do think that it's really important that a guide is put out. And the one thing that I would say about it is that there's a lot of, of excellent resources, uh, particularly legal aids process that was mentioned already. Um, and just to make sure that guidance that is put out um, is, is similar so that people are getting guidance uh, whether they come to a legal service provider, a community-based organization, or a city ah, agency that is consistent right. with each other. Got it. So this is content-based uh, question or, or comment. This is a comment based on content. And the other thing I would say about it is having put together the NYSE's materials is that it um, doing a good job of putting something in writing on this particular topic in such a way that it re either remains evergreen or that you can update it is really, really quite complicated. Yeah. And so right. to the degree that there's, a, there's an urgency around creating um, written materials either about content or about resources or places to go, um, I, I think it would be strategic to think about whether to just to prioritize this very carefully and think about them in like there are a lot there are a lot there's a lot of information about how people can find legal services out there there's a lot of information about how people can find benefits and so anything that you would want to create f from scratch that it just look at all of those things agreed do you want to add yeah, I, I would I would agree with that, and um, and I you know and just express a, a, a concern about having any any written document that the topic of which is about disenrolling um, in you know in just in terms of just in terms of the, the chilling effect. You know, I, I echo everyone's concerns about the accuracy and 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 consistency and um, and um, you know. Really, we're we're looking at the the potential scale of the chilling effect being being so much greater than the scale of the people actually impacted that um, that anything that kind of tilts the balance of the information out there towards this is how you disenroll makes me concerned. And we hear that loud and clearly. And I think what 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 it, it does is drive the point home that that this there there will be no evergreen because this is going to change, and the training of of, of people and allowing them to have the right ways to communicate to triage folks, to lawyers, which is probably where most of the talking should be happening, in front of a lawyer, and getting people there as quickly as possible is the name of the game here, and that's not gonna be enough to send emails out. Um, it's gonna have to be paired with training of the right people that will have that kind of in, uh, interaction with a New Yorker, be it at a nonprofit or walking into centers everywhere, and, and, and I'm hearing that loudly as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next and final panel is Brooklyn Defender Services, Sonia Marquez, Molly Ko, Volunteers of Legal Service, Rex Chen, uh, Legal Services NYC, uh, Yeni Hernandez, uh, 32PJ, I think you might have already left. 
and then Catholic Charities. Okay. Okay, we can start with you. Thank you. Uh, make sure the red light is on. And then pull the mic closer to you. And that's for a comment for everybody. And then you're good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Sonia Marquez. I'm a civil rights and immigration uh, staff attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, we just wanted to thank um, the City Council for taking leadership on this important issue. Um, one thing we've heard a lot from the previous panel um, from, the, from the, the committee members is the importance of individualized um, legal advice um, to sort of mitigate um, the widespread fear that this rule has caused. At BDS, um, we're seeing that um, firsthand. Um, attorneys and our social workers are receiving an increased number of calls from our clients who express fear about continuing on to public benefits or enrolling in public benefits. Um, and they're asking whether they should disenroll for the cases that, that they have with us. In addition, we're also seeing an increased request for New York, Know Your Rights um, information from community organizations um, to disseminate accurate information. Um, as, to the, as to the proposals, we, we support the five bills in the resolution um, with similar concerns that the previous panel expressed. Um, one concern that we, we did have is where folks are being referred to legal services or getting information through, let's say, HRA when they go to enroll or disenroll, um, but they already may already have a knowledgeable immigration attorney. And just making sure that whatever advice is given is sort of consistent and they're not sort of being sort of rerouted outside of where they can really just know they should contact um, someone who already really knows is knowledgeable about their case. Can I pause you there? Sure, go ahead. And so you're, you're saying, there, there's a there's a natural flow here of of kind of best outcomes that has a New Yorker engaged in a nonprofit that then engages with a legal service provider where a lawyer has gone through the case and says okay here's what's going on here's a here's a modification to your benefits go to HRA and then HRA says oh you should go to talk to a lawyer and they're like I already talked to a lawyer maybe I should talk to another lawyer and they keep kind of doing this loop is that is that what you're referring to Exactly. E either where there's, they're referred to a separate lawyer, then they get inconsistent legal advice, or we already make the determination, you know what, this may be the best course, um, and then they go to HRA, let's say, and um, then they're sort of rerouted and, and not really understand fully what's going on. So how do we solve that? Um, I think one way could just be um, if there was a way that um, social workers or our attorneys could have a direct contact with sort of HRA in that way so that they know that this person who's going is being taken care of. Okay. Okay, sorry, keep going through some sure. of the other bills. Sorry, I'm going to come back to that. Okay, sure. Um, another thing that um, we wanted to mention was that BDS also expects that legal service providers will see um, the consequences of the, of the new weighted factors analysis of the public charge rule. This will make it even harder for low-income immigrants to apply for and become lawful permanent residents. And for le uh, legal service providers who serve primarily low-income clients, the rule could really impact nearly all of our family-based green card applications. This analysis will make the applications more onerous to prepare, um, and as intended, it will also cause increased denials. And that will, that will mean that providers will have to expend additional resources in preparing the applications, in appealing the denials to USAS, and in representing clients in removal proceedings once they're referred to ICE. Um, so given all sort of the impacts of the rule that we have seen and we expect, um, we ask the city council to consider, and we echo the request made by the previous panel, um, to consider additional funding for the legal service providers um, have that have the capacity to help mitigate and combat the impact of this rule on New Yorkers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Molly Coe. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Immigration Project at Volunteers of Legal Service. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. 
Um, VALS is a small nonprofit, but we were founded 35 years ago uh, with the mission of leveraging the goodwill, resources, and talents of New York City's leading law firms um, through providing pro bono legal services to under-resourced New Yorkers. Um, and I would echo everything you know that has been said so far about um, how uh, how important the messaging is around the implementation of these bills if they are to become law. Um, I was really pleased to hear the the way that the folks from HRA and Moya in particular were talking about this because of the um, you know of all of the people that we work with, all of the undocumented. Uh, parents of U.S. citizens or um, young people who are perhaps documented or have TPS, you know, who've been coming to us, at least in the, um, on the issue of disenrollment from public benefits, so few of them are actually affected by this new regulation. And so um, I do just caution against the, um, you know, adding to the fear that's, that, the, that this rule was designed to create in these communities. Uh, regarding the issue of training for DOE staff, we support that wholeheartedly. VALS has been partnering with New York City Public Schools for approximately 20 years to identify areas of civil legal need that affect the educational outcomes for students. And there is absolutely a big difference between back then writing a letter and um, you know now sending an email and providing in-person training on a regular basis. Um, our strongest partners in schools have been guidance counselors, college advisors, social workers, the parent coordinators have been fantastic. Um, but doing that training once is not sufficient generally and so there should be some follow-up plan. Uh, even when we do, you know, we can do a training at the start of the school year and with all of the different things that our educators are juggling, um, it's helpful to have a way to maintain that communication over the course of the school year. Um, regarding, um, regarding the guide, I think this has been said before, regarding the guide uh, as it relates to the bill um, for HRA, you know, there are a lot of fantastic resources out there already. Um, you know, I remember just personally many years ago as an intern at the Public Advocate's Office spending just an incredible amount of time trying to design a guide on the, um, you know, the intersection of immigration and access to public benefits, and so I just caution against reinventing the wheel. Um, and then one other thing that looking toward the future, we are really concerned about the proposed uh, federal regulation as it relates to access to public housing for people in, uh, in families with mixed immigration status. And so I'd be interested to, to have more conversations about the intersection of that proposed regulation and um, you know, the trainings that are gonna be happening, and happening for NYCHA staff uh, as they relate to the current regulation. Uh, are you involved in anything relating to this topic uh, with administration? Have you been invited to be part of conversations at all? To my knowledge, no. Okay, great. So we wanna, we wanna help bridge that gap, uh, especially with not just the knowledge but, uh, and, and desire, but um, the, the kind of implementation part as well. That'd be great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rex Chen, the Director of Immigration at Legal Services NYC. We have three recommendations. First, I'll tell you a little bit about Legal Services NYC. We're the largest civil legal services provider in New York City and the country. And we ha our advocates have provided income, security, and stability for many of our vulnerable clients and in helping them get state and federal benefits. Um, we have extensive experience working on benefits. From 2016 to 2018, we helped over 1,900 people with SNAP enrollment, and of those, 400 of them were eligible non-citizens. Uh, in addition, we helped over 4,000 people with cash welfare issues, such as uh, TANF enrollment, and 760 of them were eligible non-citizens. So our team has a lot of experience in this area and has seen um, the impact that everyone's been talking about. And we also help hundreds of HIV positive clients access benefits every year. Um, so if I turn to the three recommendations, um, one of them is that um, if New York City proactively takes steps to protect the identity of ineligible non-citizen SNAP and Medicaid household members, uh, most people would be inclined more to access the public benefits that they qualify for. 
Uh, right now, the city's databases uh, include information about household members who decline the SNAP and Medicaid benefits, and people are concerned about giving that sensitive information during enrollment. Um, if people are afraid that uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, might at some point access the databases to find out about which household members decline the benefits, um, then they might just drop out of the program instead of giving that information. Um, so perhaps the city should uh, try to take steps to protect the identity of those household members who are declining SNAP and Medicaid benefits. Um, a second recommendation is that under the new public charge rule, um, people will be less willing to accept state or local cash benefit programs for income maintenance. And so it would be ideal to decouple certain subsidies um, from state and local cash benefit programs for income maintenance. Um, right now, New York City links its unique city and state housing subsidies with state income maintenance programs. If the city decouples them, then people could still obtain those housing subsidies even if they decide to decline all state income maintenance programs. Um, a, a third recommendation is in the same vein. Uh, the idea of uh, trying to distinguish certain benefits from income maintenance programs. And here, um, New York City should uh, decouple certain housing assistance, case management, and health insurance based on HIV status from ongoing income maintenance programs to allow people to access it even if they decide to decline all state income maintenance programs. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting uh, recommendations. And we'd like to follow up with you on that uh, afterward. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, my name is Raluca Onchoyo. I'm the Director of Immigration and Legal Services and of the Immigration Hotlines at Catholic Charities. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and thank you for your leadership and your vision in supporting immigrant New Yorkers. Um, almost everything that is to be said has been said. I just wanted to make two points. In um, our opinion, the, the two uh, problems posed by the public charge are one that we've heard a lot about today, which is the chilling effect that it has on people who are eligible for benefits and who would not be affected by the rule from um, enrolling in these benefits or enrolling their children in these benefits. That's certainly um, of, a, of great concern. Um, and I do want to emphasize the role that our hotlines can play in um, trying to address and to, to, to provide, the, to correct the misinformation that's out there. So far on our hotlines in terms of public calls concerning public charge, a lot of the calls that we're getting are coming from legal permanent residents who would not be affected by this. So it's pretty clear that there's misinformation. It's not clear what the cause of the Right. The misinformation. What's the percentage? Is there a percentage that you have uh, in your? Um, so we're just looking at about 250 calls, and about 150 of them were from legal permanent residents. Wow. Okay. Um, plus uh, at least another 20 so calls from U.S. citizens and from asylees and U visa. Naturalized people. citizens or? Naturalized okay. citizens. So if these would be people who would not be affected. Right. Um, and by comparison, the calls from people who could possibly be affected um, were in the about 60 or so. So um, again, the hotline is a, uh, an effective way people can call at any time, well, between <laughs> during the hours of operation. Um, but this is information that, that you know, can be provided at any point. So it doesn't have to be now. It can be any time the question arises, they can call us. And one of the good things about calling either the City Action NYC hotline or the New York State hotline is that what we try to do is link people. We, we don't try to answer all their questions over the phone. There's really no way to do that without looking at their papers or asking them um, in-depth questions, but we direct them to legal service providers that can answer through one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, and that's really important because otherwise people would be inclined to go to notarios or ask advice from their best friend, and this is not the time to do this. And this brings me to my second point, um, which my colleague at BDS addressed, 
but that is the confluence of three USCIS or Department of Homeland Security policies right now. Um, one is uh, the fact that people who apply for green cards uh, and who are denied the green card, if they are without status, which a lot of them are, will be put in removal proceedings. That's one policy. The second policy is that um, if applicants do not provide all of the uh, supporting documentation that's required by a particular application, they can be denied that, that benefit without uh, the opportunity to provide more evidence. So in the past, um, if somebody provided insufficient documentation, uh, they would get something called a request for evidence. That policy has been rolled back by USCIS, and now they can deny a benefit um, if it's not properly, if the application is not properly supported and prepared. So you take that policy and you add on to the add on to it the fact that you once you get denied the benefit, you can be put in proceedings, and then you take the new public charge policy, which because it, it makes it so much more complicated to apply for something that um, I think there's a, st a statistic from clinic that basically says out of one million green cards that are granted on a yearly basis, um, I believe 750,000 of them are family-based and would be affected by this rule. This, I I've looked at the um, proposed uh, form uh, for public charge. Uh, the I-944 and the regu um, I'm sorry, the instructions. It is incredibly onerous even for somebody who's experienced as an attorney. There's almost no way that someone who uh, may not have a high level of education or a good command of English can make sense of it on their own. And so if you add all of these things together, it, it makes it very important for people to get the proper advice before they apply and to get application assistance. Even, um, you know, we're talking about it in our office, Applications that we're going to prepare going forward, should the, the rule um, take effect on October 15, are going to require so much more work than ever before. Um, we're going to need to provide, um, you know, not just the application, the supporting documents, which again are very onerous, but a something close to a legal brief to explain how the totality of circumstances works in our client's favor. And this is at a time where, um, Legal service providers also have to represent unaccompanied minor in proceedings, and we have a lot of work This is on top of that. So to make a long story short, I think we need more funding uh, for something that was pretty much a straightforward type of application before that will now be a complex um, application. And not just necessarily just for application assistance, there will be many people who probably will come to one of our agencies and after sitting down with us, we'll decide and will be right to decide not to go forward because the risks are too great. And that in itself, you know, sitting down with someone, analyzing your situation and making that dis informed decision, that is a service that, that um, agencies should be um, funded to do, which is just a consultation. That may not result in, in an application. Thank you. Thank you for that, and and really kind of connecting the multiple dots to the the kind of process that's in front of uh, New Yorkers, and I think what um, really what I want to end here in because I know it's been a very long a afternoon of conversation, but we're 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 trying to move as fast as we can to set this up for success, and we really appreciate the conversations about the. Um, specifically the chilling effects that can happen with one of the bills, uh, but really pointing to uh, things that are already out there in the world. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. These are all things I'm hearing from you in terms of how we can, how we can get ready, because we're building upon a system that's already robust, but can be overtaxed with this next piece that will require more legal services, because that, those conversations that you're kind of referring to happen in front of a lawyer, and we need more legal, um, and I'm the biggest supporter of the legal services world, uh, you know that, um, but we need to understand how it all works in terms of public charge as, as we understand it and what the city can do. I love the ideas of decoupling, that's interesting, I think those have come up before, but never before have we had a reason to, to do that. Um, I'm, we're gonna look into that. 
uh, to understand how that can happen. And if any of one of you uh, on this panel or here want to help us understand that, please help us understand that. Um, what I want to, when I, and maybe not a question because I think we've kind of hit everything. For the ONA, uh, for the hotline, for the Catholic Charities hotline, um, none of the people that are on that hotline are giving legal services, correct? They are not giving legal advice, no. And all of them are giving information about how to get legal services and to connecting people to legal services, correct? Correct. And do it, all those people need training to do that work? Do you train your folks that are on the call line to do that work? Yes. Is this something that we think that anybody can do in terms of does it require a legal, a legal advice or a legal background to be a hotline provider? So our hotline staff is trained um, on, on a monthly basis. They get legal updates. They don't have to give legal advice, and actually that's a fine line to walk to actually have the information and provide it in a general sense and not give advice. But they do understand all of these pieces and how they work together, not just for public charge board, for anything else that they may get questions on. Got so it. So just for context. Just for context. they can. But then they can say, okay, here's what you got to do. Um, they, can, they can catch red flags. Um, as they're having a conversation with a caller, and then can say, you know, this is a this could be of concern. We really strongly advise you to talk to an immigration attorney before you travel out of the country. It sounds like there may be some issues that you need to discuss. So they're and not go talk to a lawyer. Yes, <laughs> and go, talk, go to talk to a lawyer, and then all the referrals that we make are to nonprofits, right. nonprofit legal service providers. If a caller indicates that they can pay, then we um, connect them with ALA or to some of the bar associations to get referrals. Right. Right. And I guess what I, what I want to just point to is there's a version of that that could exist and should exist in frontline services of some sort that we can negotiate with the administration so that people are understanding how to triage and have context with a continual, not just once, but continual training of our, of our teams. Because the last thing we want to do is give anybody, uh, when, uh, when the highest percentage of people who are calling are actually not at all impacted, and we've all, we all know that. Most people are not impacted, but that's the whole point of this thing is to impact with great fear all New Yorkers that might um, think that they have, but to, to, to have people ready when they're engaging city services uh, and be able to take them to, to the right place. And one of the biggest barriers is language access. Uh, and we, we've just, this has been a continued issue with the administration. Language access is not where it needs to be. Uh, the concept of a, of a language bank, uh, language interpreter bank has been floating around but hasn't been rooted so that, so that people can have access to an interpreter when they're engaging city services. So these are all ideas that we're trying to really kind of pull together so that we can, we can offer as policymakers, and, and that's what we do at the council, we create the policy and the administration executes that policy. We wanna make sure that they execute the right policy, and this is why you're so important to this conversation. So we wanna follow up with some of these things, um, and if there's any last comments you wanna give on anything, then with that, we're gonna call this hearing to, uh, to an end, and we wanna continue engaging in these conversations. We wanna go fast, so, but we're gonna take a step back digest, and then, and then keep moving forward. Thank you all, and this hearing is now over.